This is the August 8th, 2016 meeting of the Auburn Board of Selectmen. Uh, this meeting is being recorded. Is there anybody in the audience recording this meeting tonight? Yes, so we have uh, one from the uh, Worcester Telegram and Gazette. Uh, being no others, we rise to the salute to the flag. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. We have no public comments for tonight, and uh, we have a couple of public hearings tonight. First, I'm gonna hear from the Superintendent Ken Smith of the Auburn Water District for non-essential outdoor water use restrictions. Ken, would you come up? You can stand at the podium or come up and sit with us, whichever you're comfortable with. This is fine. Uh, thank you for inviting me. My name is Ken Smith. I'm the Water Superintendent for the Auburn Water District. Uh, as Chairman Holstrom said, uh, as you know, as a customer of the Auburn Water District or the Woodland Water District, or even the Elm Hill Water District, you've <laughs> recently received notice of increased restrictions in your outdoor water use. Uh, to give you a little background, um, last January, the city of Worcester invoked a stage one drought advisory. One of their upper reservoirs was already showing signs of substandard water levels. We thought they were out of it, and soon thereafter, they went back into stage one, and on the 22nd of July, Worcester went to a stage two. Uh, in Auburn here, the Woodland Water District customers and the Elm Hill Water customers receive their water from Worcester. So those restrictions that the city impose trickle down to those two uh, water districts. Within the Auburn Water District, the commission has been monitoring our water supply, which comes from 12 wells. We've noticed drawdowns from normal, about 10 feet below normal in some of the wells. So we're seeing it there. Uh, in an effort to be conservative and not to stress them too far, on the 27th, the commissioners invoked um, additional outdoor water use restrictions. Every year, uh, the Auburn Water District, because we're in the stressed Blackstone River Basin, uh, under our water quality uh, management permit from May to September, there is a restriction on outdoor water use. You probably recall nothing nine to five, and uh, if we stay below uh, the state per capita use, there's no restriction on how many days a week you can water. Well, this recent uh, notification, which all our customers were mailed out, uh, you either got them in a the bill or you got them as a direct mailing. Uh, we enhanced those restrictions uh, by moving them up from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. and going to the odd even watering based on your address. Uh, in a short time since that's been, that was issued uh, a week ago on the 29th or so, uh, the notices went out. We've seen some decline in water use and through the cooperation of all our customers, we hope that's going to continue. It has not done anything for the water levels in the well. If it did anything, it helps to stem the further drawdown, the little rain we have had. Uh, it rained the other night, but when it comes down and, and gushes, it runs off, it doesn't soak in. So uh, we're just hoping for some additional precipitation, significant. Uh, a drought doesn't start instantaneously. This drought started last March, when all that snow we had in two, this is March of 2015, when all that snow that we had from that wicked winter melted, we have not really had good precipitation since then, and so it takes a long time for a drought to build, and it's going to take a long time for it to go away. So uh, hopefully with continued cooperation of all our customers, uh, we've seen cooperation from the fire department, they're stemming, you know, training, using a hydrant, DPWs holding back on their water use, and through everybody's cooperative effort, we hope we should be able to get through this with no further restrictions. If it continues to be dry, then the next step would be a total ban on outdoor water use. 
So hopefully we don't get to there. Uh, thoughts and prayers of getting some precipitation. Thank you, Kenny. As a matter of fact, on the uh, the weather I've been monitoring, uh, we're still like eight inches plus my uh, of uh, water that we need in the ground, and it's um, yeah, we're way behind. So correct. That's you this know. year, and then we were short last year. I think the two of them together are about fourteen or fifteen inches. Okay. Uh, deficit. Uh, I'd just like to thank uh, Darlene Coyle, Julie, uh, Amanda for their assistance in posting these notices on the town's uh, media pages. It's a good way to get it out and, and, and thank you for doing that. Uh, we post it on ours, but the more exposure we get, the, the further the message gets out there. So. I appreciate your time coming in tonight, Kenny. Okay. It's very, very important that we conserve water when we can, and uh, we thank you for bringing it forward to us. If there's any other questions, I'd be happy to answer them for any of the board. Do we have anything else? Okay. okay. Thank Kenny, you. thank you very much for your time tonight. Okay. We have a wine and malt package store license. Hadashan Incorporated, 860 Southbridge Street in Auburn for 705. So um, I'd like to uh, open the hearing. Motion to open the hearing. Second. Okay, motion been made and second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Um, would the representatives of Haradashan please come forward? And would you introduce yourselves and just tell us a little bit about what your plans are? Yes, yeah, so my name is Daksas Thakur. He is my brother, Harsang Thakur. He is the owner of the Haridasan Corporation. And we just opened the business. We have quite a few businesses in the road of rural and Canadian Massachusetts. My brother just moved from India last year. And we opened the first business at the subway in the Webster. Now, second business is the gas station we are opening. So far, we had a lot of complaint about the gas station previously. And since we picked that business up, everything perfect, perfect. And we hope in the cooperation from you guys. And like, you know what? Hopefully, we can do better with the beer and wine and malt license if you guys can allow us. Excuse me, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Um, I'm sorry. Due to the air conditioners, could we ask the applicants to come oh, okay. Would you please I'm come up? Okay. Them. Would you please come up and sit here at the, the bench with us, please, so that. Uh, all our members can hear exactly what you're uh, saying. The air conditioning is a little bit uh, yeah. loud and masks some of the uh, the sound. Okay. So again, if you would please. So, my name is Daksha Sakur. We just came from India, and my, I'm here since like 17 years in this country. My brother moved last February 2015 to this country to immigrate, and we wanted to have the gas system right now we're working we opened like last month yeah on the uh, second of jewel, jewel so previously we had a lot of complaints about the station like the stage two wasn't done like the fire extinguisher never done everything since we picked up as i said like the town requirement like we had a lot of problems we pulled we solved the problem everything the way we supposed to be in the code because i am doing the gas business so long and we had opportunity because what I hear from previously, they had a license available. So I said, no, let's try to get the license. So it helps the business, you know. One was on the other hand. So like, if I add beer and wine malt license, maybe we can stay better in the business. So I ask you guys if you can approve us to add a license. Okay. Is there any questions from the board? Yes, Mrs. Goodrich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, so right now you're selling gas, and and what else are you doing? Are you, I, I'm very familiar with the location. Are you doing small convenience? Yes. Are you doing lottery? Yes. Um, and because you know what, there's a lot of competition nowadays. I try to bring the more offer into the customer. This is the second one. The guest is always there, uh, being the convenience store. At this moment, we want to add the beer and wine and the license, and so on. We need to add. Like, if you offer more the customer, I get more of business. Without the business, I can't stay in, you know, because there's a lot of expenses with every business. Obviously, the our expectation is not too high to be a million, but to just do the right business. So, like, in the future, we wanted to add some more offerings, means like, the some rentals of the vehicles for the 
like you halls. You hall and, and any other facilities that we can attract the more customer. We have to bring the customer back. What because of being the site was closed for so long, and in between we opened like month, two month and a half ago. But the problem was the occupancy permit and lots of problem we had faced because the company wanted to push us to open the business quick, but. We don't have anything in our hand, so we sat down and then like we everything we make over everything the perfect, and now us to move like one by one. I can't add everything in one time. Look, this is the first venture they be doing the beer and mine, and then after we're gonna go for. But U haul is like something like we offer the service to the customer, so we can bring some customer back. Yes, Mrs. Goodrich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so I do have a couple more questions sure. and a couple comments. So, um, are you? Currently having regular hours of operation. Yes. Do you stay open because it, I, you know, I have to say I'm, I'm like in the vicinity there, and it doesn't seem to be consistent being opened and closed. Um, so, what will be your steady hours of operation? I mean, if it's slow, you can't just close the doors if you're if you're holding a valid license. Seven to nine. Yes, our, the, the business hours are going to be morning, 7 to 9 o'clock in the night. This seven, is the hours we're going to be. 7 to 9. Okay. And so now you just mentioned, may I, Mr. Yes, Chairman? please. You just you. mentioned that, you, you know, you, you're doing things to um, bring in business. And my, my concern with that is we see it a lot with the smaller convenience stores as well. You know, and I understand the need to, to bring in business. But you bring in so much, be it the gasoline, the U-Hauls, the lottery, now beer and wine. Who's watching the store? Who's ensuring that everything is Me, operating my properly? My brother himself, my brother and the family, and we are the one of the partner. He's and taking care of both businesses. And, and what experience do you have in um, selling alcohol? Selling alcohol, I did have a, a, a packet store in the, and I'm also buying a couple more packets. But didn't you, you said he'll be doing the day-to-day -day operation? So that, I'm asking him, what experience do you have in selling alcohol? Yeah, I see my brother's another property at Connecticut, and I looking everything over there for uh, four or five months over there. When I came back from the India on the February 2015, I see the business over there, then after I move to Webster, and I uh, buy subways over there, and from the uh, April, my wife's looking the subway, I looking some uh, his, uh, business over there at Connecticut. So, around five or six months experience I have it. So are you TIP certified? Yes. Not, I, he's not, I'm, he's asking, not. I'm asking the person I who's going to be running the day-to-day -day operation. Because it's my understanding that he... No, I don't think. He don't have one deal. Okay. But he's going to get you before he... Before who is, who is running the day-to-day -day operation here? You'll be you'll be running. Yeah. Okay, so basically, I my questions will be directed to the person run, doing the day to day operation. So, so tell me about your understanding of tip certification and how you ensure that you don't, and how that ensures that we don't sell to people who shouldn't be having alcohol. Explain to me your understanding of tip certification. Can I explain because the English is the problem a little bit? Can I explain in okay. my language? Okay. So, as per the law, we know uh, under 18 we cannot sell over there and at the under 21. When, uh, somebody come, come over for the asking uh, beer or wine or, or cigarettes and we look he below 18, we ask for the ID. 21 years, beer and wine is. 21 years, okay. So we ask for the ID and uh, we look if the eligible then we can sell it, otherwise we can say no. Okay, if I may just add a little bit to that. I know that we've run into problems before with uh, uh, other liquor licenses in the town, uh, beer and wine included, as well as the package stores. And uh, when you just mentioned something about if he looks or she looks under 21, um, it's always a good thing to 
card everybody. everybody that way there's Absolutely. no question there's no problem just so you understand that I think that'd be something you want to look into when you uh, you know open up and get going here yeah since like he came in the country first I gave him the training that's without ID nobody it doesn't matter if you like you 50 years older better to ask ID the regular customer comes in no problem it's, it's, it's not important for us but follow the law what's the law what's the town ask you can sell below 80, uh, 21 is no then we cannot sell it over there customers not taking I don't mind it but we believe laws we have to follow any kind of conditions that's a simple thing so when the customer uh, I did not have any kind of permissions we cannot sell anything from the our stores as soon as we get the permit like occupancy permit everything then after we open still between this one we can know because of only beliefs as per law we have to follow that's it nothing else so law says below 21 you cannot sell that's it no May I ask yes. another question? Yes. So I'm, not, I'm not seeing it in the packet, so um, it would have been better to have a diagram. But how, mu how much parking do you have available for for non non stations at you know um, customers who aren't there for gasoline, but to go in for lottery and. Um, so you're understanding. I want to know how many parking spaces you have, whether they're clearly identified, lined, and marked, and um, how many employees and employee spaces you have. I think two for handicaps and seven for other cars. So there's two handicap and seven for other than gas. Yeah, they should be mentioned over there. And the rest of the over there who person taking the gas is an individual. But in other parts over there, two for handicaps, we have mentioned the sign over there. And rest of seven should be I know that regular that's, part. I know that that's not part of the license that we're right. going to issue, but it is a concern because of Route 20 there at Albert Very Street easy. and how busy it is. And we don't want to have any traffic tie-ups or any problems up there because of a lack of parking. Parking there, so it's, uh, it's a concern that uh, we would uh, ask you about. I think they are the two and seven plus the other side of the employee can park. Other shots will be open over there, but that's so not we a have not mentioned space, the line over but there, but we can do it over there. Okay. Uh, yes, this is good. So, um, so I know that you you um, you pump the gasoline for the customers. If you were to have alcohol available for sale, would there be someone in the store at all times? Would there be at least two employees, one inside the store and one out pumping gas? There's nobody out pumping. That's not. A, that's a full service, not a self self service. No full. No more. You're full. not doing the full service anymore. So it's completely self service. Self service. Yes. And. And if there's an issue with anything, they go inside. Yes. Used to be full services, but I think uh, yeah, they I, yeah, I know. Been been there many times. So there will only be one person on duty at any time. Yes. It's not a huge store, small store, so like cannot afford. If if you need two, you but if can require, have. we can manage for the two employees, you know. But right now, how is going more over there? We can do it. Okay. We have the family in eight person, so we can easily manage over there. Okay. Well, the tip certification is going to be something that's going to be required for anybody that's working there and going to be selling alcohol, and they'll have to be of age in order to be able to serve that also. Yeah. Uh, yes. It Mr. Berthier. Sounds to me like there's some I's that need to be dotted and T's crossed. So my question is, um, if we don't um, give the license at this meeting, do they have to start the entire process over again? Can they come back? Uh, a month, two months from now, say that yes, now we're TIP certified and yes, we have an understanding, this is more what our hours are going to be. I'm not getting a, a good feeling that all of this stuff is really set in stone. And okay. so my question would be that if we deferred this to make sure that all these things are put in place, I also don't want them to go through a six month process again. So what what is this the process? Well, let me... Uh approach the town manager and maybe she can help me with that. Yeah, uh, through the chair, you could continue the hearing so you're not closing it. So this current application would still be pending um, because it was already advertised and followed the process. So I would say that you could continue it. You could also, if you had certain conditions you wanted to put on it, you could give a license conditional upon obtaining
obtaining TIP certification, obtaining other types of reviews that would have to be turned into our office for verification before the license could be released. Um, I would think the best thing would probably be to continue it until such time that uh, they could get their TIP certification. Okay. Yes, Mrs. Goodrich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Mr. Bertram, I appreciate your comments because you can, I'm sure, hear the concern in my voice. Mm -hmm. And one of the comments, and I'm sure, you know, it, whether it's a language issue or just complete, you know, lack of knowledge in the area of TIP certification, a real red flag for me was when you said we can't serve under 18. You may have meant to say 21 or you explained to him it's 21. That's a real red flag for me, so I would rather see the day-to-day -day operator of the business have a, a little more understanding or at least minimal knowledge of TIP certification. Mm -hmm. So I would completely support a motion to continue the hearing and um, you know, have you come back to us with a little better understanding of the operation of and your responsibilities as um, the holder of a, a liquor license. Okay. Um, the motion has been made. Is there, a, there is a second. Uh, is there any further discussion? I guess my question would be um, to you is you want to get this license going, uh, you want to get to work on this tip certification, sure. understanding of the laws right away, and what kind of time would you, you know, uh, would you need before you come back here? He, uh, I can come back like next month. I don't, he can be right now if I, as soon as I go down there, he's going to be work on that to get the tip licenses and going to be everything else on the side because this is a priority for us mm -hmm. because the right now the convenience store is going not do good because of the, we're not offering too much stuff to the customer and we have to rely on this license and as i said like we do everything and our hand to do it and accomplish the way you're supposed to do it and i assure you that like that's not gonna be have, if you ask him tomorrow you're not gonna have the same problem okay i assure you that definitely and i can put my name on the business if you want it but as i said like but day to day I can because you know what I'm I'm out of the road again so yeah, no, but I can train him to a real. You're saying probably by next month I can. D okay. As I said, like he's working from now on, so like I can next week he will be perfectly all right. I can put him in the liquor li liquor store to work so he understands the language and then he get a certificate tomorrow. When is our next meeting? September 12th. September 12th. Have we got a lot on the agenda to do that night, or we should be able to finish that? Not at that this up? point, we don't. Um, okay. Through the chair, if I can just add, just, just a reminder, once the board here gives their local approval, this still has to go to the state ABCC for their final approval. They're the ones that actually issue the license. Okay. Um, and just to point out, as a new applicant, we sometimes have applicants who aren't aware of this, but licenses expire in December of the calendar year. Yeah. So you're getting a license, but then you're going to have to read if this goes through you will then have to renew it uh, and you get notification in November you renew with a, a vote of the board in December so to the board if this license were to go through let's say you go through September 12th it goes to the state and they finish maybe say October you'll still have a couple of months to see how this works before the renewal comes up okay so it's almost like a nice trial period for you mm -hmm. to see if it's working before you decide to renew it for another whole year mm -hmm. so the motion been made could we amend that motion or say for September 12th. 12th. Okay. Second. The second, okay. Is there any further discussion? And just under comments, if, if you feel that you're not ready for September 12th, just notify us Definitely. and we'll, we'll move it up to the next meeting. Oh, okay. But we really want to see you have a real, real comprehensive understanding of the TIP certification and Absolutely. the serving of alcohol. So sorry about that. That's perfectly all right. No, we, we'd rather discuss it here so you understand exactly what's to happen. Absolutely. Thank you so much for your guys. Okay, so Thank motion, you. the motion has been made and seconded to... Uh, Continue this hearing September 12th. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Then, like I, she says, if um, you have any questions or you've got a little delayed with something, get a hold of the uh, the town manager's office and uh, discuss it with them. Thank you so much. Thank, Thank you, you very much for coming in tonight. Thank you. Thank you. So Thank you. Have a good Thank you. we have um, let's see. 
Yeah, yeah, I know. I okay. just didn't know if we could move up one of these or not. Mm, let's see. Just a Okay, why don't we have them? Yeah, let's just go around with it, okay. All right, next on the agenda, we have a presentation by Ken Ethia and Bill Coyle, findings on the Ramshorn Dunbrook prior agenda item from Glenn Kravosky. Uh, I'll ask, you know, whoever representing uh, Glenn, Ken? Great, thank you. You come up and join us at the bench, if you would, please. Mr. Chairman, members of the Board of Selectmen, Madam Town Manager, good evening. I'm Ken Ethier. I live at 404 Leicester Street. And for somebody at home maybe watching that doesn't know who I am, my hobby has been hobby in history for probably the last 20 or more years. My mother and father's family came to Auburn in 18, I can document 1862, and we've been here since. That's probably the reason that I am so much interested in the town history. Um, I was asked to do some research on the brook uh, that goes near the library uh, out of Auburn Pond, and near Fuller's, and ends up down at the uh, bowl for the diversion tunnel. And, uh, Here's what I found. First off, let me tell you, this was a lot easier than the last time I was asked to do something. I ended up with uh, Selectman Simone walking 35 miles to find the uh, granite markers and <laughs> corner points. This took a lot less effort, I have to say that. But um, things I found, I went back to 1794 and the maps for the town of Ward. Uh, as you all know, Ward was from 1778 to 1837, what is now Auburn. And those maps showed that uh, stream or river, the French River was a name for it back then on, on all the maps. And um, what we know now is the Auburn Industrial Park, Sword Street. Of course, that none of that was there then, but that was uh, French Meadows. So whether that had something to do with the name of the stream, probably somebody lived there and that was their last name. That was only a guess. I haven't really found anything that would, uh, would tell me that for sure. But the, the next name you'd see on there uh, would be the Dunbrook name. Now the Dunn family ran the uh, mill at Jury Square, and I actually found that uh, Ken Holstrom's family was, was neighbors with, with the Dunn's. Uh, it's, it's, it's on some of the early maps if you wanted to see it. And the Dunn name is probably, it was probably incorrect, being that uh, what we know today at Auburn Pond was called Dunn's Pond then, and where the field is for the high school was Dunn Field. I think they just kind of used that name um, because there was people that lived there at that time. But being that's been the name they've used for the last hundred years, according to my research, uh, that's probably the correct name. I, I'm, I'm just presenting the things I found and asking uh, you to make the decision on that, I guess. Um, that, that stream, a lot of people probably don't realize it goes uh, it goes next to Fuller's, and we probably forget about it after that. But eventually, it, it uh, travels down to where Kettlebrook would meet in with it, uh, near where the bowl is for the diversion tunnel. The diversion tunnel was put in 1959 to send the water directly under Packetjog Hill to keep Webster Square from flooding. I don't know if you're even interested in that part of it or not, but um, then it would feed into Leesville, Leesville into um, Hadwin Park Pond, to Curtis Pond, to Middle River. And uh, it was, I learned an awful lot about the different streams and different ponds in the town doing this research. If, if ever um, something else comes up, I'd be more than happy to share uh, what I did learn. The other name that uh, was given to me for that brook, Cliffy Granger, I went and visited him. And he traced what we call Dock Brook, one of the two Dock Brooks, from up on Prospect Hill. He told me exactly where it went, where it went under Route 12, but he calls that Stony Brook. And he seemed to think that what we've called Dunn's Brook should be called Stony Brook. Um, 
Those are the, that's the information I found. I think Glenn even has some other names for it. He, he used some different maps. So that, that's, that's basically pretty much what I found for names. Are there any questions? Uh, Okay, I guess tonight, uh, before we get started here, I guess the question is, um, we want to name that brook, and you want to have signage along South sure. Street for that brook, and I think that's what you're here to do tonight. I, I think Glenn actually has a, a, a different name that he had found. I, I guess what I would like, I, I don't know what the, the simple answer is, there's no simple answer, I guess. So what I, my goal was to give you people the uh, information that I found, and uh, I really don't know what, what the name should be of it. Uh, maybe because it's been done for a, over 100 years, that's it. Uh, French River was what it was named in early times. And correct me if I'm wrong, but I think, Glenn, you found some other names? Just Google, which is newer, calling it Ramson Brook and looking at the from Ramson Pond coming down through. Uh, we just took the 8.15 square miles draining to Route 12, Southbridge Street, and we compared the 2.6 seven square miles that drain down from Dark Brook or Stony Brook. And normally on uh, USGS maps, we're going to call the main tributary the larger river system, the, continuing the name through and not the smaller. But uh, but Dunn's Pond had been there, um, at least in some, whether it's erroneous or not. Dunn had been, uh, I guess the gentleman said, from the field at the high school. Nothing was conclusive except for maybe the original French River from that French meadow. But but even in Oxford, uh, Menexit Brook was called by the Indians, which is now the French River. So names do change over the years. Uh, so and I didn't notice that on Southbridge Street that there is the French River there and it's marked as the French River. But you're saying now as it breaks down the tributaries here and there that uh, the names change. And as Mr. Ethi had mentioned tonight, that it could be Duns Brook. Uh, it was right near the shoddy mill there at the corner of uh, Auburn. Yes. In, um, Southridge Street. So it was, um, it's done. Ramshorn is not uh, familiar to me. I haven't heard a lot of that. That's not a uh, popular name I've heard, but okay. Duns is. But again, um, I'm not really sure what direction to give you with this, with putting a name on there and what kind of permission you'd have to get from the state in order to be able to do that. The normal permission um, that we've done with Oxford and with uh, Webster so far is that the selectmen ask for a, a certain signage saying that it is in their town. They, we gave you some examples of Webster and Oxford, what they've said to Mass DOT, and because it's a Mass DOT roadway, the Mass DOT never had a problems in the past. We've been doing this since the 80s, getting these names done. Even Mass Turnpike, the French River sign on the Mass Turnpike, we went for that one too. So I think it really depends on what selectmen want or choose to have it named because it's it's nothing conclusive that we that I found okay. or, or the historical commission is there uh, any questions from members of the board Mrs. Goodrich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, first of all, Ken, thank you so much. Like, you come in here. I, I enjoy it. We, we talked on the phone, enjoy and, um, <laughs> you know, we're so fortunate that you not only do this for us, but you do it with such passion and enthusiasm. Thank you. And you need to start, you know, we do a walk-in tours. You need to start doing your own tours, because you, we can <laughs> learn so much from you. But to, um, thank you. To follow up on the signage, Mass DOT will put what we ask them, so there, you know, they, there wouldn't be any red flags like, oh, they're asking us to rename something. So if we were to do this, I would want Mass DOT to know that we're looking at re not just requesting a sign, but renaming something that has been named for years. Um, as Mr. Ethia said, you know, the best information he can give us is there's lots of information and really no clear answer right now. So, Now, uh, if I may, uh, have you approached the Historical Society in, in whole or part and asked them any questions and what they know of their background? I'm not trying to be a smart aleck with your answer, but usually if somebody goes to the Historical Society with a question, it comes back to me, so no, I didn't. I, okay, <laughs> thank you. I just want to be sure so that, uh, you know, it was... I, I would be glad to do that if no, you No, no, that's fine. That's fine. I have no problem with that. I just wanted to know if they were in, you know, part of uh, the question and I, answers. I, I haven't. Okay. But can I also say that I'm really impressed with Glenn coming forward where he doesn't even live in town, and, and, and I think he's a special person. I think this is really a special project, and I would love to see more things in town with names on them. So so the young people in town could 
just put a name and have have something to to call different places in town. Thank you, Glenn. Thank you very much, Ken. Well, I guess I'm going to turn to the board and ask what the pleasure of the board is. We hear from Mr. Coyle. Yes. Oh. I just I didn't I don't know what what his thoughts are on this as DPW director. I, I can thank you, uh, members of the board. I can just give you my thoughts based on the meeting that we had earlier um, this evening with, with Mr. Kowalski and with Mr. Ethia, uh, where, where plans that Mr. Ethia had researched uh, go back as far as 1892, referring to it as Dunn's Brook. Um, I understand also with what Mr. Kowalski is saying that in uh, more modern times, they may look at naming a, a brook based on the contributing area in the larger brook continuing through um, as well. Um, but I think locally, and again, with the historic research being referred to as Dunbrook, um, you know, I, I would be inc inclined to probably recommend that it, it be named Dunsbrook, but obviously that's up to the board to make that decision. But I know you probably didn't have the benefit to see the maps that Mr. Ethier has. Um, I was fortunate to be able to see them, and they, they, they do go back you know, almost 125 years, and that's when the map was documented. So even prior to that, it may have been referred to as Dunsbrook as well. So. Okay. Thank you. Mr. Kowalski. One last point. In Oxford, there was a select woman that lived next to a brook called Wellington Brook. Wellington was 1835 to 1935, but the mills next to her property, the Colonial Mills, were trip hammer mills, raised the hammer and dropped down for water power. Because the family named the brook and they lived on it, the Walkers, Mrs. Walker, Alice Walker, they ended up calling it as a nickname Trip Hammer Brook. So when I was naming other brooks in Oxford, she said, well, I'm going to name this one next to my house on Route 12, and it became Trip Hammer. Brook. But over the years, we researched. I grew up on Wellington Brook at the headwaters up off of Old Worcester Road, near the Auburn Line, the old Kesney Moss gravel pit. Over the years, we researched it, uh, probably seven or eight years of uh, looking at it, went to all maps, found it was only called Wellington on all the maps, ref referencing this historical figure, Wellington Charles. In the end, the selectmen uh, did agree to uh, go back and ask Mass DOT to put up Wellington, which with all USGS maps referred to and other maps as we found. So uh, getting back to Mass DOT doesn't normally argue what you might ask them to do. They had no argument about Trip Hammerbrook and eventually over a number of years when we finally did more research it did finally now in Oxford down Route 12 you'll see uh, Wellington Brook which is what everything else knows it as. So, so that, just that point of they don't argue about what you, you ask them to do. Um, has any members of the board got any questions, comments? Um, any idea? I'll make Mrs. I'm happy to make a motion, Mr. Chairman. Based on the presentations and um, Mr. Coyle's comments, I would make a motion that we designated Dunsbrook and request that Mr. Coyle contact Mass DOT for the appropriate signage. The motion been made. Second. Second. Sharon, have you got the motion? Okay. Is there any further discussion, comments, questions of Ken or Glenn? Being none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Dunsbrook it is. Thank you, Thank you so much for your time. time. Thank, Thank you very, very much. much. Appreciate it. Okay. Um, I would like to move up um, five, item 5A on the Board of Selectmen General Items, the interview. Motion to move up agenda item 5A, interview of a finance committee candidate for precinct 4 2. Second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Right. Mr. Sansusi, please. How's everybody doing tonight? We're doing just great, and thank you very much for taking your time to come in tonight. Um, we have here. Um, Mr. Sansusi of Levin Grandview Street, who is applying for a seat on the Finance Committee representing Precinct 2. Oh, and yes, our Finance Committee Chair, Kevin Hussey, is also here tonight, and we thank you for being here tonight. Okay. Can you give us a little bit of background on who you are, Trevor, please? So, um, my name is Trevor Sansusi. Um, I moved to Auburn uh, in 2012 um, as a renter, recently purchased in December of 2015 um, on 11 Grandview Street. Um, I've always had a, you know, 
passion for getting involved in, in these types of things. Um, went to Worcester State University and was involved in their, um, their student government and in turn kind of got involved in the strategic planning processes, um, various other committees within the school. Um, currently, I'm working at Bolus Lynch in Worcester, um, CPA firm. Um, kind of getting a feel for working with a lot of different businesses at the same time and, and um, I was really interested and, and passionate about getting involved in Auburn. Um, my family's been here for a while. My grandmother lives on Jeffrey Ave. She's been there for over 10 years now. Um, and I just want to get involved. I want to be a part of the town. I want to feel invested in the town. Um, growing up in Worcester, obviously there's a you know rich tradition in Worcester and everyone's very passionate about it and I want to kind of dive into that around here and see what what Auburn has to offer. Sounds like a passionate interest, and that was one of our first questions of what your interest in your background is here. Um, the second thing we have, what is your special experiences, skills, what have you got uh, to uh, bring to the Finance Committee? Um, well, like I said before, um, in my time at Worcester State, I dealt with, um, I was on a couple different committees that I thought were um, transitional to this position, um, some of them in particular, there were some, a revenue enhancement committee working on trying to find different ways to bring new money in um, and work with the money that was already there to kind of spread that a little bit more. Um, also strategic planning, um, which went across all different sectors of the of the school and trying to, um, you know, co-mingle everything together and come up with a better strategic plan, which I think um, could work with the finance committee as well as bringing those other com bringing us together with other committees in the town of Auburn um, and then also obviously for a finance committee um, I mean working in public accounting I deal with different industries on a regular basis um, you know familiar with accounting principles and in you know tax regulations and things like that where I could bring that expertise to the committee and you know help in any decisions that would involve such Technology. Now, have you got any time constraints? Uh, the, the, the meetings can be a little bit um, unscheduled. I mean, during the budget season, it can be very, very time consuming. It could be meeting once a week. I don't know if uh, Kevin uh, would ever have them more than once a week, but that'd be during the budget season. But uh, the rest of the year, there's a lot of transfers. There's a lot of uh, things going on within the town departments. Have you got any constraints on your time uh, with your job that uh, you wouldn't be able to meet? I'm nothing outside of the, the normal nine to five. Um, other than that, I can I can make myself as readily available as as need be. Um, even if there were things that came up during the day, I mean, I'm flexible enough. My company's flexible enough where I could make in day meetings work if it were a possibility. Not as regularly as once a week, but you know, on a need be basis. Okay, terrific. Okay, has any other members of the board got any questions? Any comments? I'll ask Mr. Hussey, have you got any questions? And again, thank you for being here tonight. Your background sounds like it's uh, definitely going to be an asset for uh, our finance committee. Uh, being with the laws, with the budget you have, with several different uh, businesses that you deal with, uh, your background sounds like it's uh, just the proper thing that we would love to have here. And uh, you're ambitious, and it sounds like uh, you'd be a, a great asset to us. Thank you. Yes, uh, Mr. Carpenter. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we appoint Mr. Sansusi to a term uh, representing Precinct 2 on the Finance Committee expiring on June the 30th, 2017. And thank you for coming forward. Second. The motion been made. Is there a second? Second. Final thank you. Uh, any further questions or comments? Yes, Mrs. Goodrich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, thank you for coming in and, and being interviewed. And I just want to comment that this is the first interview we've done with our new boarding committee interview process. I think it went well. I think I thank the chairman for asking the questions, and it was a very smooth and comfortable process. So thanks for coming in, well prepared to uh, answer those questions. No problem. Thank you for having me. So motion been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Welcome aboard. And thank you. Thank, thank you for being here tonight. Yeah, I'd like to move up um, 5C and 5, 5C and D. D, D yeah. I'd like to move up 5C and 5D. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion to move up um, item 5C followed by item 5D. Okay, motion been made. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Um,
first, we're on 5C, we have a common virtual license, Miss M's at 914 Southbridge Street, and uh, we should have all our paperwork and for that in front of us. We'll just dig mine out here. Okay. And we have a representative here, and um, would you um, introduce yourself, please, and just give us a little background of uh, what your plans are. Okay. Um, my name is Emily. I'm the owner of Miss M's. It's a hot dog cart. I'm planning to put at 914 Southwood Street in Auburn. Um, I am applying for the common vehicular and the transient vendor. I do plan on having a 50 there at the location. On being there as of right now from Tuesday to Saturday 11 to 4 and those are my preferred hours um, I'm not certain how busy that's going to be this is my first time um, doing this and being at this location so I wanted to be covered in order to do an event or you know um, really keep my bases open okay. So 914 Southbridge Street yeah. is the big parking lot uh, in front of Halligan's uh, Bar there? Actually across the street at Sheldon's Harley Davidson. Okay, yep. thank you. Just so we know exactly where that was. Yeah. I had, um, I was kind of confused a little bit. I wasn't sure whether it was going to be in the big lot because I know that they've had other things over in the other lot across the street. Yes. But I wanted to be sure that we knew where that was. Okay. Does anybody got any questions? Yes, Mrs. Goodrich. Thank you, Mr. Sean. So, um, have, have you come to an agreement with Sheldon's? I know they have. Yes, I actually, yes, I've written permission from oh, them. No, I oh. see that. I'm sorry. I did. Oh. Um, okay. Where are you going to set up? Will you be set up at the, you know, at the same location for every event? They, they have a lot of events. And so one of my ongoing concerns has been parking and accessibility. So I'm wondering where you're planning on setting up your proposing picnic tables. I'm just um, looking ahead at a future um, license because I'm concerned about losing parking area. So okay. have, they, have they told you where they'd like you to set up? Yes, they have. And where so right when you be? pull into the parking lot, it would be towards your left, right next to the grass. So towards route? Um, yeah, thank you. Parallel to Route 20. Right, but but closer to Route 20 than the back of the yes. lot is what you're saying. So you, you pull in, the building is in front of you. you. There's a large parking lot to your left where they have the propane. And um, so you'd be to the, the immediate left, close to Route 20? Yes, closer to Route 20, not towards right. the building. Yeah. Right. But currently where it's striped for parking spaces? Um, it's, it's what the owner prefers. Okay. But so I can ask him exactly where the position would be. I haven't brought the trailer there yet, obviously, so I'm not certain on exactly where. Okay. And if we approve this, you, you, you're assuring us that you'll be set up in the same location, not moving around, so that when we potentially approve future licenses for Sheldon's, we'll know that that area is already taken up. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Thanks so much. Okay, I guess um, we had a representative of Sheldon's here. He had to leave, but have you uh, spoken to Sheldon's and they are in agreement with all that your plans are for uh, the hot dog stand and for the uh, also for the uh, transit vendor? Yes, they are. They're aware of everything. They are aware of everything. Okay. Yep. Um, the. Uh, Transit vendor and common vigilant license at Miss M's. They had a meeting on August 3rd, and the requirements there the applicant shall obtain all necessary permits and inspections from town departments, boards, or commissions, and the hours of operation shall be Mondays through Sundays, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. So that gives you a, an open window of time. But you're saying 11 uh, to 4, and that'll be from Thursdays through Saturdays. Tuesday through Saturday. Tuesday, Tuesday through Saturday. Through Saturday. 
Saturday. Yes. Okay. Yep. All right. And if that changes, just to uh, please uh, come back and let us know that uh, you know you've extended your hours. I think that would be a, a good thing to do because uh, it's it, it's an open door right now, 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through uh, Monday through Sundays. But if you're only going to be doing it for five hours, if you were going to continue it, you know, expanded time, then it might be a good idea, Drew. Just give us a call and let us know that it's going to be expanded time. Yes, uh, Mr. Carpenter. Mr. Chairman, can I just ask the town planner a question regarding, uh, because this is an existing business, I'm concerned about parking. Mr. Jacobson, do you, uh, So they are required to keep a certain amount of parking available as part of their site plan. So I just want to make sure that we're not falling afoul of another regulation that Sheldon has. Matt, thank you for coming forward tonight. And yes, sir, thank you. Kind of shed some light on that for us, please. Sure. Uh, from what I understand uh, through the chair, that Sheldon has more than enough parking to accommodate the standard requirement in the bylaw. So uh, the space is taken up by this. I don't assume would encroach the minimum requirement that's provided on their site plan. I just have okay. one follow-up, Mr. Chairman. Yes. Because Mrs. Goodrich does mention, and I know we have something, we just had something at the last meeting. They do have a lot of events there. Um, and I know that parking has been an issue that Mrs. Goodrich has brought up numerous times in the short time I've been on the board. What, if any, provision should we be thinking of when we're licensing businesses um, to make, to ensure if they are having, I think we have two or three in the next month that they're having special events so that Miss Sousa can actually have a thriving business and we're not running afoul of the bylaw. Sure, I just want to make sure I understand the question correctly. Are we asking if we should restrict how many parking spaces that Sheldon should have versus the food truck? Well, my concern is because they have a great deal of special events at Sheldon's. Mm -hmm. um, you say that they have more than adequate parking for normal business. Right. So that's, I come in three minutes, three hours later, somebody else comes in. When I'm having an event, I have 500 people coming. Mm -hmm. um, do we have adequate parking in that? We have had a member mention numerous times that we've had people crossing Route 20 from Halligan's parking lot, and they're seemingly having to utilize neighboring properties right. to sustain these special events. We now, you know, introducing a new wrinkle into a business that already seemingly is at its capacity during these rather large events. So that's that's my concern. Sure, I understand. And thank you for clarifying, I appreciate that. Uh, from a planning perspective, all I can really interpret is what's allowed in the site plan. Regarding uh, Ms. M's food truck, uh, that being separate from Sheldon's as a whole, I feel like any conditions you want to apply on Sheldon's future events would be on their applications uh, as opposed to this. And I believe one of the reasons that, from my, in my understanding, that Sheldon's is, is trying to pursue a food truck it was instead of applying for a common vic license to serve food at the facility itself. Uh, I see this as a uh, as, an, as a better op option than having it on site. Okay. Thank you. Well, in the past we've had um, um, Sheldon's here and that was part of the, uh, you know, things we wanted to have done is have a police officer so that we'd be able to cross people, you know, and uh, so I believe that should be on their Sheldon's for the permit for their activity and not so much for this one. And Mrs. Goodrich, then I'll get to you, Lionel. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I do have one, I, first of all, I fully support a hot dog truck. I think, like, hot, I think food vendors play a huge role in, in a society and it brings <laughs> people in and I support it and I did it many years ago. Um, one of my concerns, though, is the hours of operation. When when we had Sheldon's in the last time, they told us, I believe, um, that they closed at 7 p.m. There was a there was a there was a concern about some um, noise and activity, and they assured us that they closed at 7 p.m. Um, my concern is if you're still operating after their hours of operation, it encourages what what they explained to us happened that you know once they had closed, people were doing wheelies and blah 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 blah. And so I would just prefer that um, the license be restricted to um, no later than Sheldon's hours of operation. 
if I may, yes. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Um, just want to clarify, we are examining two different license applications, and when the DCG recommended the 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. Monday through Sunday, it was more for the transient vendor license to be able to operate throughout town. Regarding Sheldon's, the, the hours being different for a separate license would be sensible to me as well. Mr. Berthew. I have a comment more than a question. Just uh, from a safety standpoint, I've been in Sheldon's and where it, it appears that you're going to set up, uh, I'm picturing a, a hot dog truck like any other uh, food vendor that people are going to be waiting in line. And the more me they wait in line, the more they're going out into the parking lot. So my comment would be that I'd, I'd like to see you consider parking the truck so that the line went more toward the clam box property um, you know instead of out into the parking lot because cars have cars and motorcycles have to come off of route 20 and sometimes they come in a little bit hot and you know I'd hate to see it just seems to me that there's a pedestrian problem if there's people waiting in line I don't know where the, the picnic table is going to be that's my only comment with it is uh, for the, the safety of the people Is there any other questions, comments? Just, yes. just my last comment. So, so I would appreciate it if we we could restrict this particular license to 7 p.m., where you're you're only going to be set up at um, Sheldon's. If you if you increase your business in Auburn and you you're gonna park your food truck someplace else and staying open later would um, would be beneficial to you. I'd be happy to revisit that. But where you're just proposing Sheldon's, um, I'm, I'm going to ask fellow board members to um, restrict the license to 7 p.m. so we don't see any of the issues that we saw. Okay. If, mm -hmm. okay. uh, are you going to make that in the form of a motion? I'll make a motion to, okay. hold on, because it's two separate motions, mm -hmm. right? We're working on the common virtual license right now. Yeah, so okay. I'll make a motion to um, approve the license, provided that all applicable requirements of the state and town and any of its departments, boards, and commissions have been fulfilled. Said license is subject to all conditions stated upon it. Failure con to comply with any and all conditions shall invalidate the license and render it null and void with the conditions of the DCG to be placed upon the license with the exception of the eight to 7 p.m. change. Second. The motion been made. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Brother. Um, the original application, can we change that if uh, that goes forward tonight? Yes, it just goes okay. forward. All right. Um, have you got anything more to add? No, I do not. Okay. And, well, Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't see that. Mr. Carpenter? I just had a question. Uh, Mr. Berth, you mentioned uh, pointing the vehicle in a certain direction, and I, it sounds like a, a wise idea. Would, it, would Mrs. Goodrich consider including that in her motion? Sure. So with, with the addition of par parking the vehicle so that any um, forming lines are... It would go parallel right. to Southbridge Street. Be, um, the truck would be facing west. Okay. <laughs> Correct. Okay. West is Route 20 West to go up no. to Southbridge, right? Have you got okay, that Sharon? So the truck would be facing west. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> okay. Is that what you wanted? Yeah, that's okay. fine. <laughs> All right. The motion has been made and seconded. Um, Mr. Benoit, have you got anything further? No, sir. Okay. Um, no other questions. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. And the common vigil should be uh, taken care of in the original license, uh, the, the original application. Can we uh, revise that to make it 7 p.m. as of tonight's meeting? Mr. Yes. We've got to finish this one up. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And uh, the second thing we have tonight is a transient vendor license for Ms. Adams. And we have that application also in front of us. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we pr approve the license. Let me get the language. Um, approve the license provided that all applicable requirements of the state and town and any of its departments, boards, and commissions have been fulfilled. Said license is subject to all conditions placed upon it. Failure to comply 
comply with any and all conditions shall invalidate the license and render it null and void with the conditions of the DCG to be placed upon it with the, um, with the exception of a um, 8 to 7 p.m. hour of operation. You want to keep that? Okay, so you will make that 8 to 7 also. Okay, so the motion has been made. Is there a second? Second. This is brother? Second? I second. Oh, okay. Mr. Carpenter. Mr. Carpenter. Okay. Is there any further questions, comments? Being none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Mr. Susan, good luck. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming in tonight. I'd like to uh, move up item 5H, and that's um, vote of maximum useful life of departmental equipment. So moved. Is there a second? Second. Okay, all those in favor? Uh, Aye. Okay. Um, as I say, a vote on maximum useful life of departmental equipment for borrowing purposes, authorized May 3rd, 2016. Um, and we have Debbie Terrian with us tonight. Okay, could you uh, let us know a little bit about what your, uh, the plans are, Debbie? Can you move? Um, what you'll be voting on tonight is uh, the equipment pieces of the um, borrowing that was approved at the annual town meeting. Um, we have school equipment, um, furniture, and we have school food service equipment. Those two will, um, we've checked with the school department that'll last for uh, 10 years. Uh, so that will be structured so you're paying over 10 years for that piece. Uh, the police radio equipment will last for five years. Um, so we'll be paying on that on a shorter length of time. Okay. Has anybody got any questions? Okay. Standard. So we have the school tech furniture and equipment. Uh, the borrowing amount is $155,000 over 10 years. Uh, and this is for maximum useful life for, for right. up to 10 years. Up to 10 years, okay. yes. Okay, at least. Can, can, excuse oh. me, we've consulted with the school department uh, on this. Okay. okay. And then uh, also for the school food service equipment, $20,000 for 10 years. And they are, you, you've spoken to the yes. school department all, on both yes. of these. Yes. All right. Yeah. And then the police radio equipment is $30,000. Dollars for five years. Five years. We've also talked with um, Police Chief Lucas. Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. Is there any questions, Mr. Carpenter? Mr. Chairman, I'll just make a motion that uh, the board states that the maximum useful life of the department equipment to be financed with the proceeds of a borrowing authorized by vote of the town passed May 3rd, 2016. Article 4 is hereby determined pursuant to. Mass General Law, Chapter 44, Section 7, to be as presented on the list as provided by the Treasurer Clerk. Is there a okay. second? Mr. Berthium, thank you. Any questions, comments? Being none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you, and thank you, Debbie, for coming in tonight. Thank you. Mr. Chairman, can I ask that you take item 6A in conjunction with item up, the one you hear? Okay, so it's, uh, it's um, five. Move up five C. Okay, I'd like to move up item five C. So moved. Second. No, we've already done. We've already done five C, so it's right. it'd be. I'm sorry. B. Five we've done five C, so it'd be. Um, I'm sorry, it's an E. Five E. Five E. I'll make a motion that we move up uh, with the chairman's. Uh, Indulgence. Okay. Uh, item yeah. 5E and 5F seems that they appear to be yes. okay. conjoined. Second. And could you also join that? And also item 6A. I'll include That's items for the day. Back of job golf course, I love the town manager items. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay. Thank you. Um, so the first we'll take is the. Uh, 
Item 5E, the one day beer and wine license for the town of at the package of golf course. Uh, through the chair, Mr. Coyle, yes. DPW Director, uh, and Shannon Regan from the Technology Office are both here uh, to explain what we're doing here. So if I can just jump in um, and turn it over to them. But we've uh, been looking at different ways to enhance the golf course from infrastructure to improvements um, to enhanced marketing and uh, creative ways to promote the golf course. And many, many people come in and ask us if we're going to have a, I'm sorry, thank you, if we're going to have a beer and wine license. Um, so our, our proposal uh, application to you this evening is for 30 consecutive one-day licenses as opposed to going for a full beer and wine license for the whole year. We are doing this because we feel it would be a good opportunity for us to try out um, how this works, make sure all our systems are in place. It gives us one month to get ready and see if it's working and work out any kinks before we potentially come in uh, next year for a full beer and wine license. And I, I thought tonight would be helpful to the board if we have uh, Shannon explain what the process is for the one day licenses and what some of the requirements are from the state, even though a state vote isn't required. And then Bill can go through what all the preparations that he and uh, Kristen and the golf course employees have made in anticipation of this to assure you that we are ready to do this. So I'll turn over to Shannon. Thank you. Um, so like Julie said, a facility is allowed to have 30 one day beer and wine uh, licenses through one agent or person. Um, so we decided to do the 30 day block because you have to be granted for delivery as well as disposal of all of the beer and wine. So it just makes it easier that way for drop offs and then to make sure everything is off the premise at the end of those 30 days. Um, so on August 12th, that will be the first delivery and then August 13th will be the first day of sales. And then on September 9th will be the last day of sales and disposal and by September 10th, everything will be off the premise. So we're covered in all the legality cases for that. Um, and like Julie said, it's only granted through us, and then we give a notification to the ABCC just for a heads up for them. And I talked to the executive director of the ABCC as well, just to make sure that we were in compliance for storage, delivery, and disposal of all the alcohol. And he said that the 30 consecutive days were in compliance and everything was okay in that um, regard. And I also talked to a separate uh, assistant as well at the ABCC, so we're covered with that. The only other part is they have to be from an authorized source, which we have three authorized sources, Atlas Distributors, Quality Beverage, and Martinelli. So those are all approved by the ABCC as well. Um, and then that's who we would use. And then the hours are between 10 and 9, which complies with both our bylaws and the ABCC's laws as well. And I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Well, I guess the first question I'm going to have here is, the hereby apply hereby apply to the Auburn Licensing Authority for a one-day beer and wine license. And now you mentioned it's 30 days, days of op hours of operation, Friday, August 12th through Saturday, September 10th. It's for 30 days. Um, I just want to be sure that we're getting this right here. It's not just a one day, it is for 30 days? Yes, and if, if just for records purposes, if you want me to make 30 separate one-day licenses, if that would be better just for record purposes, I'm happy to do that as well. Um, so each would be taken basically as a one day in terms of the ABCC regulation. Um, but like I said, you can have 30 consecutive, you could use 30 on the weekends, however you want to use it. So we just chose to do the full month. Well, I guess I'm going to turn to Ms. Jacobson and ask her what um, you suggest we do with this. Because it is saying one day beer and wine, but it's saying 30 days it's going to be in place. Uh, how do we make sure that this paperwork continues and we have some continuity the board, with I, I think it's fine to have it submitted this way because we did say it was 30 days of one day beer and wine licenses. We could have submitted 30 of these um, okay, which, and they all would have been identical right. except for a different date. Okay. So what we did is we put it all on one. For purposes of the board, we're happy to issue, as Shannon said, we can just print 30 licenses yeah. versus 30 applications. And then every day we could put the, the one day license up 
Um, I think legally it doesn't it doesn't matter. Shannon had run this through the head of the ABCC, and he said that this was an acceptable way to do it. So okay. we're comfortable with it. Great. Um, and if I may, I think, and if it's up to you, um, but it might be helpful if Mr. Coyle just kind of presented a couple of things that they're going to do because it might answer some of the questions that the board may have, and then after that. Um, you may still have additional questions, but a lot of preparation has gone into this, and I'm assuming you're going to want to ask the questions about what happened. So, um, maybe Mr. Coyle, would you please? Good evening, Mr. Chairman, members of the board. Thank you. And uh, I'd like to first start by giving you an update on the golf course and how things are going. Uh, we've had a, a lot of positive comments, and I can tell you that the. Um, in terms of the revenues that have, have come in, and to date we're at $248,000 for the year. And if you remember the um, budget that we uh had targeted for the year was uh, budgeted for FY17 uh, was 300,000. So we are now at about 83% of our target, and uh, we still have quite a bit of the uh, the golf season left. So I, I think uh, at this point, it, it's most likely that we will exceed the 300,000. Uh, so where it is an enterprise fund, we are self self sustaining, and we're hoping that at the end of the year there will actually be some retained earnings. And I think initially at town meeting we had felt that. For the first five years, our goal was to break even and not lose money, but I'm, I'm happy to report this year has been uh, it's gone very well. I think we've had uh, great staff. I, I, I can't say enough about the people that we've hired to work not just outside the golf course, maintaining the grounds, extremely hardworking individuals, but also the staff inside, how friendly they've been. And um, I, I haven't had one complaint about anybody, only compliments about how uh, happy everybody is that the town has taken over the golf course and how how well they think the changes have been and uh, they seem to be very happy with that so I'm, and I'm, I'm thrilled because when I go there to see everybody happy to come and even today I was there at around two o'clock and we would already had over 50 golfers and for a Monday um, where a lot of people like to golf on the weekends that's excellent and yesterday we had 169 golfers so it uh, we've had great success with the amount of golfers and also the use of the, the uh, golf carts as well so that's just an update and we have to answer any questions regarding that as well uh, but in terms of the the beer and wine license I know Shannon has done a lot of work on researching this and uh, Kristen Pappas is here this evening as well who Kristen is working as our clubhouse manager and I think she has uh, has been known uh, to everyone there now as kind of the face of the, the clubhouse because she's always there and uh, doing her work and she's kind of trying to juggle everything that she did before and continue with this and I, I, I won't speak for her but I think she loves being there um, she's always smiling up there but Kristen always smiles anyways but in terms of the uh, beer and wine license I can tell you that we have uh, seven uh, plus Kristen, so eight people that are TIPS certified. Uh, they were all certified uh, last week. And, uh, and additionally, Kristen, as the clubhouse manager, is also now certified as a crowd control manager. Although I can say that I believe unless your crowd is uh, in excess of 100 people, you technically don't need one, but she is also now certified as a crowd control manager as well. Uh, our policy is going to be that Everybody gets carded. I don't care if they, they're 80 years old. If they don't have an ID, we don't serve them. And if they get upset, that's that's okay. It has to be our policy, and, and we're going to be strict with that. And it, I don't care if they come every day, and we know who they are. If they don't have a license, they will not get alcohol, period. And I'll, that's been made very clear to all of our employees as well. Um, the seating capacity for for the clubhouse since we've since we've added the deck on uh, we can we have about 45 seats that are allowed um, or available for, for patrons although based on uh, the building commission certification uh, we're certified for uh, 34 inside and 35 outside I believe it was a total of 69 total 30, yeah, 34 inside 35 on the deck I don't expect that we would come close to that unless we have a large function, unless we have a uh, nine and dine type of function. But you know, typically there, there wouldn't be that many people. Um, I, I believe. I mean, it would be great if we did have that many, but I'm, I'm not expecting that. In terms of 
operationally. Uh, initially, we, we told, normally have one person working the counter uh, because we do expect that one person is not going to be busy, not just um, handling the customers for, for golf purposes and, and for the golf carts, but um, also for, for serving beer. Uh, we would bring on another uh, person as well, and that would be from 4 to 8 p.m. Monday through Friday. And then on Saturday and Sunday, uh, probably 11 to 4. And, and we're going to gauge, see how this goes. And, and we may actually, depending on how, how busy we are or we're not, if we find that selling beer and wine really hasn't increased the, the workload, then we may not necessarily need two people. But I think at least starting out where this is just more of a trial basis for 30 days, I think it's, it's the wise thing to do. Um, I can tell you that since we've opened, it's been the biggest comment that we've received from people. We have a suggestion box, and the biggest comment is when, when we'd be selling beer and wine. So, uh, you know, the, the golfers, I think, do at the end of a end of the golf match would like to come in and have a, have a beer. They don't stay a long time. Once it's dark out, they go home. They're, they're all very um, mature and professional people, and I can, I can tell you that um, we've had no problems with, with people uh, there to date, and I would expect that they would continue to act mature and professionally. Um, so staffing in terms of ranges, we will have ranges on on the weekends and then we'll, we're going to evaluate the need probably just that we would initially start out just on the league nights to have limited time where the ranges are going to be there because during the day I don't see you know during a regular weekday a huge need for ranges. So initially Tuesdays and Thursdays and again if we find that, that that's not needed, we may be able to pull that back. If we say, you know what, things really haven't changed from how we operationally were functioning before, uh, whether or not we need to keep the ranges on for that time frame as well. Um, and I think those are most of my items that I want. Oh, we had some signage issues um, from DCG. I shouldn't say issues, we had them on the plan, so we had already come up with them. Uh, we, and I think Shannon had recommended uh, no alcohol beyond this point, so that's gonna be the clubhouse and on the deck. So this is only for the clubhouse and the deck. When they purchase alcohol on, on the premises, they, they cannot go outside, but they'll walk around and, uh, with, with the alcohol that they've, they've purchased. So there'll be signage in both locations. The additional person that would, would be brought on from the 4 to 8 p.m. time frame during the week and 11 to 4 Saturday and Sunday, that person would be somewhat of a floater to walk out onto the deck and try to keep keep their eye on things and how things are going operationally. They can come inside. If they, there is help needed behind the, the, uh, the desk, they can help uh, with the customers as well. So I, I think we've, we've, we've had many meetings with the town manager, the assistant town manager, with, with Shannon and Kristen and, and others, and we, we try to go through as much as we could in terms of what things uh, do we need to make sure that we're taking under consideration and um, you know certainly there's always things that additionally that we can do to improve operations but we tried to think of everything that we could so I'll be happy to answer any questions that you may have. Okay. Mr. Berthew. I have a few questions. Um, first of all do we uh, is Packachog booking tournaments at all uh, at this point? We, did, we had tournaments more, uh, Kristen, you want to, uh, more towards the earlier part of the year. Typically fall is fall and spring, uh, big tournament times. Yes, good evening, board. Um, we have a tournament scheduled for Auburn Youth Football, September, uh, the second Saturday in September. Um, so we have a couple different organizations in town looking to have tournaments, um, but we only have one scheduled right now. Yep. We've had a few in the past. They've run very well. There's two different styles of play on your tournaments. We have tea times uh, up to four people every eight minutes, and then we have a shotgun start where we'd have to close the course prior to to get everybody in their cats and ready. But we we, um, we look forward to this opportunity. Thank you. Um, there's a reason for that question. Uh, my second question is um, how are we, are we planning on, uh, if somebody buys a beer, are we taking the can opening it, pouring it into a cup and handing the cup, or are we handing them a can of beer or a bottle of beer? How, what containers are we? It, there'll be no glass allowed on, on the property we're going to sell. It's only going to be cans or aluminum bottles. Um, I mean, t you know, typically we would ask them if they, if they, if they want a glass, but it would be plastic. So I, I suspect that most of the patrons are probably going to want to just drink out of their, their can or their aluminum bottle. But you know, we will offer them uh, something to drink out of, but we won't 
will insist that they drink out of a plastic glass. My thought process is tabs and caps and things on the course that... Like, yeah, again, our goal is that they don't leave the, the building, the, the clubhouse, with the beer. Okay. Uh, and that's what we'll be watching for. There'll be signage there. You know, our employees will be instructed, don't allow them to leave you know, the building with the drink. And so, you know, that's something we'll be watching very closely and because uh, certainly we don't want to see that as well. Yes, Ms. Baptist. Yes, thank you. I'd like to address that. There is um, a separate, um, there's a separate permit for that, um, that you would drink on the course that we don't currently have. So it would be um, not permitted for people to leave the clubhouse and the deck with any open container. It's actually against the law. Uh, so until we're permitted to be on the golf course, the people that are consuming alcohol on our premise will only be able to do so in the clubhouse. Okay, thank you. And my final uh, reason for asking about the tournaments is, you know, I read through this and it says that you were going for a 30 consecutive one day, uh, Friday, August 12th through Saturday, uh, September 10th. And my thought process was it's a test and we want to see how things go. And my feeling is obviously it's going to go pretty well um, so my thought was you know should we maybe get a 24 day you know one permit for 24 days and then maybe get like six one day so that if we have a tournament say on third week in September and we want to do a one day license it gives the town an opportunity because we're going to have a captive audience at that point and that was my reason for asking about the tournaments. Mr. Jacobson if you would please. Uh, through the chair and I can tag team with uh, Bill and Shannon. We initially looked at um, starting August 10th, 12th and going Saturdays and Sundays through uh, November because of that same reason. The problem we ran into is you're not allowed to store liquor on the site if you're not licensed. So every night we would have to get rid of any liquor that was remaining on the site. Um, and you're not allowed to take it out yourself, which would mean a distributor would have to come back and get it and they won't do that. So there's no way to have a one day license and have the storage on site. The fact that we're rolling it consecutive days, we're allowed to order the alcohol, have it delivered and have it stay there for that 30 day period and then that's why the pickup date is so important. So. And, um, and you can also have in the future if you had a tournament, you could have a caterer come in under their company and um, request a one day beer and wine because it's even though it's at the same location it would be a different company so if that was the case if the tournament really wanted that as something that they had at their event they could have a caterer come in as well so that option is still open you just wouldn't have it through the town entity itself so through the chair after speaking with the ABCC uh, we realized there was no way to break the license up into segments of two four six or eight it doesn't work with the distributors you have to be a, a um, official recognized licensed distributor in Massachusetts in order to remove the alcohol and store it. And so we couldn't even store it anywhere else in town. It would have to go right back to the distributor. So they will deliver, but they won't pick up at the end of the night. So um, it, it put that option off the table for us. And as Shannon said, the 31 day licenses are, are restricted to an entity, not to a site. So a caterer, you know, if we've spoken to the chamber and they know if they were to have a tournament late September, early October, they can get a caterer to come in and get a one day license. Any caterer can pull 30 one day licenses as well um, because they take the alcohol off site with them. They're licensed through their catering license to store the alcohol at their sites. So they have the license to store. We don't have a license to store. Okay. Mr. Berthew. Just, just the final comment on that, it, and that's wonderful that they have the, you know, the caterer can come in and do that, but then Auburn doesn't benefit from the profit of that, you know, so, um, but I understand uh, fully what you're saying, and, and it was just a, a thought process after reading. No, Thank we you. appreciate it. Thank you. We wanted to do that. Um, we were actually up until about a week ago, that was the direction we were taking until the issue of the storage uh, was brought to our attention through Shannon's contacts at the state that um, there was just, unfortunately, there's no way to do it that way. Okay. 
Mr. Carpenter. I just have one question about uh, the cost of liability insurance. And before you answer, I just wanted to say how well everything was put together from all three of you. It, it looks like uh, you thought of pretty much everything. So I appreciate the hard work you, you've done to Thank you. make this work. Thank you. Through the chair, I'll have Shannon answer that. We have had uh, two meetings with our insurance representative regarding the liabilities. Sure. So um, we, John Brissett, is working currently on the insurance for the 30-day period. We talked to him briefly before about the cost of a full year because it's just easier. Um, and at this point, I came back and asked. He had a few questions that we had to get back to the agent as well. Just our policies, just for liability concerns. So we still haven't got the final numbers. I did talk to Eddie, and it wasn't an exhaustive an amount more and it was pretty minute in the um, increase of cost so once I get a copy of that I'd be happy to show you um, I should get that very soon we were in discussions okay Mrs. Brotherman um, I would just like to share that I have had nothing but positive feedback from the residents regarding um, package our golf course um, I had the pleasure of being helped on by Mr. Strozina. I recently went in to do Father's Day um, gift cards, which I would recommend to anybody. Um, unbelievable. Unbelievable. What a fantastic job to all of those who participated in this project. Truly an asset to the town. Thank you. Thank you for all your hard work. Thank you. Mrs. Goodrich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, uh, you know, I'll, I'll echo everything that I, my fellow board members have said, but, you know, I'm just so impressed with the the application process. You know, I'm sure people see, like, oh, the town's going for a beer, on, beer and wine license, one day beer and wine license, and it's kind of just going through the motions. If every applicant provided us with such detailed and comprehensive information, you know, you know, approving a license, I mean, you've, you've seen we... We take our job very seriously, especially when it comes to serving alcohol. And um, you have gone above and beyond. I mean, everyone is already TIP certified in the anticipation of this. Um, Mr. Coyle, we've mentioned to um, others who have come before the board to encouraging them to please adopt the policy of carding everyone. There are a couple locations in town, only a couple who are doing it, and I applaud you for that. If you, uh, if you ID everyone every time no one no one gets through so um, I am I am happily going to support this congratulations to all on the successful operation as you know when it was first before us there were some concerns and I too have only heard positive things and I think this will only be um, you know an excellent addition to the operation which we already have so I will happily support this thank you is there anything else? Mr. Chair, I just want to say, I also, I just want to echo and thank uh, Bill Coyle and his leadership in DPW and Shannon and Kristen, everyone up at the golf course, they just have done a tremendous job. Uh, Eddie and I have spent a lot of time with them working a, a plan for this. You know, we, we, I want to say that we want to come back to you after the 30 days and let you know where we stand financially on this um, because I do think it's going to be a revenue enhancer. 30 days is not a perfect gauge of what a full year would be because by the time the word gets out that we have it, we may lose a couple of weeks that you're not going to get on the whole year. But the intent is we'll come back to you and report. And in addition to what Mr. Coyle said about this year being at 83% already, that's just since July 1st and that was supposed to be for the season. It's in your report, but I just want to highlight it for anyone who didn't see it. But last year, the FY16 revenues um, gave us a net profit of a little over $48,000 and that was opening in March, a very rainy, cold April, um, and then a decent May and June. So we came in above our estimates for FY16, and we're well on track to meet, if not exceed, FY17. Weather dependent, I, I hate to say that, too early. Um, but I want to also thank the board for your support in this. I know um, it, it was a calculated risk that we took to do this, and I, so far it's working out well, and it's because it's being so well managed, and people are enthusiastic, and we're getting golfers back that hadn't been there for years and they're coming back and they're saying what a wonderful experience it is and they love it there and they, if you haven't been go up and see the beautiful clubhouse and the beautiful outdoor deck it's just it's really a stunning asset for the town and we're really proud that you've given us the opportunity to, to work on it so thank you 
Anything else? I'll entertain a motion. This is on item 5E, the one day beer and wine licenses. Mr. Chairman, I'll make a motion that we approve the license, provided that all applicable requirements of the state and town and any of its departments, boards, and commissions have been fulfilled. Said license is subject to all the conditions stated upon it. Failure to comply with any and all the conditions shall invalidate the license and render it null and void, and with the conditions of the DCG to be placed on the licenses, all 30. Okay. Yeah, we'll do that next time. Okay, so the motion's been made. Second. Mrs. Brotherman, second. Uh, any further questions, comments? From Shannon or Bill? No, thank you. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Now we'll go to item uh, 5F, the common virtual license, and that's for the Package Jog Golf Course, and you have your paperwork in front of you on that also. Mrs. Brotherman. Mr. Chairman, I'd like to make a motion that we approve the license, provided all the applicable requirements of the state, in town, and any of its departments, boards, and commissions have been fulfilled. Said license is subject to all the conditions stated upon. Failure to comply with any and all conditions shall invalidate the license, render it null and void, and with the conditions of the DCG to be placed on the license. Second. Okay, the motion been made and seconded. Any further discussion, comments? And any comments from Megan, Bill? I think. Okay. Uh, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. I think you'll do very, very well. And thank you for all your hard work on this. Thank you. Okay. Let's see where we are here. Back. Okay. Back here. I don't think it was. Yeah. Okay, well, let's go back to uh, item 4A Executive Director of Senior Center Elder Affairs, the announcement on the Senior Citizen Real Estate Tax Work Off Abatement Program. Were we supposed to do 6A? Yes, Mr. Berthium. I'm sorry, uh, did, did we, didn't we include 6A, or is that what we just. I thought we included six. To be fair, it was included as an informational item, so it didn't require it's only a vote. informational. Okay, thank you. Okay. So again, uh, item four A uh, communications. Um, Ms. Jacobson. Uh, we have a, a letter in your packet from the senior center director just um, asking if the chair would kindly just read the letter uh, just so the public knows and our seniors know the start of the this this fiscal year's um, tax work off program. Okay. And this is uh, directed to the Auburn Board of Selectmen, uh, July 22, 2016. The Senior Center is now accepting applications for the Senior Citizen Real Estate Tax, off, tax Work Off Abatement Program. Senior citizens of the age of 60 may perform 125 hours of work for the Town of Auburn and earn an abatement of up to $1,000 per fiscal year towards their real estate property tax. You are eligible for this program if you are 60 years of age as of July 1st, 2016, are the assessed owner of the tax property, and have an annual income of less than $30,000 of single or $40,000 if married. Your assets, your assets cannot exceed $50,000, excluding the home in which you reside and the car you regularly drive. Applications are available at the Lorraine Glick Norgren Center for Goddard Drive or by calling 508-832-7799. Applications are due back at the Senior Center by Thursday, September 1st at the close of business. There are limited spots available and that comes from Mignon Murray, the Executive Director for Elder Affairs. Okay. So now we go to, um, let's see, item 5B, flammable storage, revoke the license for 189 Washington Street in Auburn, Mass. And in close, we have a letter from Town Clerk Deborah Creamer requesting that the board votes to revoke the flammable storage license for 189 Washington Street as the LP tank and fueling components have been removed from the property. Chairman, I'll make a motion to revoke the license. 
Okay. Second. Okay, so the motion been made and seconded, and that's for, um, that's, we're revoking the license because all the equipment uh, has been removed. Is there any further discussion or questions? Being none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Five B. Okay. Now, we have um, item 5G, the entertainment license, Sheldon's Holly Davidson, 914 South Retreat for September 8th through the 11th, 2016. Um, Mr. Yeah, through the sheriff, I may. Uh, the gentleman was here from Sheldon's, and he received an emergency phone call, and he did uh, find Shannon to let her know that unfortunately he had an emergency and he had to leave. Uh, I'm not sure, Matt. Uh, the DCG had already looked at all of these entertainment licenses. This one, this particular event, wasn't on the initial schedule, but the DCG had made a recommendation that um, as long as they followed all appropriate permits and as you had amended it. Uh, Mrs. Goodrich, I believe, to make sure that there were police details. I contacted the police chief who reached out to Sheldon's to ensure that there would be extra, or I shouldn't say extra details, but details extended beyond the hours that you had given the license. So I don't know how you want to proceed. Unfortunately, uh, the event that they're looking to get an outdoor license for is prior to your next board meeting. So uh, you could approve it without the gentleman here. It's the same person who's been in here probably three or four times this okay. year. The application um, I'm seeing here in front of us is um, it's an entertainment license uh, for the 8th through the 11th of September, and it goes from 11 a.m. to 7 p.m., and Sunday, I guess there's some other times there. I didn't get that, it didn't print out properly, I guess, on in the application. But um, nevertheless, uh, it's for music being played outside. Um, I guess the only question I have concern over is, um, you know, the uh, the amount of um, sound that there will be projected in that. I know when you have a, uh, a uh, an activity like that with so many people, the the um, volume is turned up a little bit. But um, other than that, it's just for playing music outside. So I guess, Mr. Berthium. Well, Mr. Chairman, uh, it sounds to me like it's the same, pretty much the same thing they've asked for and we've approved. Um, uh, through, the, through you to the town manager, have we received any kind of um, bad feedback from any of their other events? Mr. Jacobson. Uh, through the chair, not uh, recently. They, I believe they did step up the um, increased details. My office has not received any calls, no. I can't speak for other members of the board who, who may receive them, but we have not received any. Um, they are aware, uh, they've had several conversations with our office about <laughs> making sure to, you know, make sure on the parking, on the details. We've had several conversations with them. Uh, we've spoken to the person who does their catering as well as the person who does their promotions, and they're aware of what licenses and permits are needed as well. I can't speak to this specific event without the gentleman here. I don't want to speak for him, but I, I do believe if there was a problem, we could always have someone step in. It's a three-day event. If there was a problem on one of the days, mm -hmm. I'm certain uh, with the police detail there, we could make sure that we handle that. Well, that was my question. Um, the DCG has, uh, the applicant shall hire police detail if overflow parking is made available on the opposite side of the street. So it sounds like the police detail is strictly for the parking. Uh, in the past, the activities that are out there not being part of that activity. Have there been police details other than the traffic flow for uh, people walking back and forth across the street? Through the chair, it's only been um, when there are people walking back and forth. Uh, there, I believe it was the last meeting you voted an entertainment license for uh, several events that they had in August. Right. And I believe the motion was made and approved to ask uh, them to consider having police details extended a little bit beyond what they're saying their closing hours are because we had heard that the hours were not really ending at 7, it was ending more at 8 or 9. And again, that's where I reached out to the um, police chief and he reached out to the owner of Sheldon's and talked to him about making sure that there were extended details. Okay. Um, September 8th, 8th to the 11th, 11 a.m. to 7 p.m. and Sunday is, it looks like 11, but till when on Sunday? I apologize. Uh, well, I, I do you know what the uh, 
this is what they said. Okay. Mrs. Goodrich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, so I do have a concern of not um, not knowing what that um, that time is on, on, on that. that Sunday. But I would point out to board members that um, that school is back in session. It's a Sunday. Um, I'm not seeing it. It is a four-day event. Um, I have. I don't necessarily have a concern with the Thursday being till seven. Although I would have preferred six, but I would I would. Um, request that board members vote to have the music on Sunday no later than 6 p.m. Um, it's, um, again, it's a four-day event. We, we've dealt with um, noise issues in that area in the past. I think after four days of entertainment, I think in respect to the um, neighboring residents in that area, I think 6 p.m. is reasonable. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, uh, you want to make that in the form of a motion? Sure. sure. Um, I'll make a motion to approve the license, provided that all applicable requirements of the state and town and any of its departments, boards, and commissions have been fulfilled. Said license is subject to all conditions stated upon it. Failure to comply with any conditions shall invalidate the license and render it null and void with the conditions of the DCG to be placed on the license. I'd also like, like to place a condition, an additional condition that music um, end on Thursday, September 8th and Sunday, September 11th at 6 p.m. I will second it for discussion purposes, Mr. Chairman. Okay, I, I thank you, Mr. Carpenter. Uh, Sharon, have you got that? Okay, Mr. Carpenter. I just had a question, and if I missed this on their previous one, because I know Mrs. Goodrich has mentioned numerous times issues with traffic and, and whatnot. If we could adjust the uh, police detail to, to say that uh, if she would amend her motion to say that she shall, that the applicant shall hire a police detail, or we'll contact the police chief about a detail and we'll follow the recommendation of the police chief. I don't, I'm not comfortable with the overflow parking in that. Um, it seems to me that it's a busy road um, and it really should be up to the chief. It shouldn't be left to, well, overflow parking. It seems to me that we should be giving the chief as much latitude as possible. Okay, so you want to amend that, have that motion amended so that uh, the police chief be uh, okay. contacted to determine the level of service? So, so I'll, I'll, I'll um, I, so. I think it's best to amend the DCG comments. Okay. And say, and on the last bullet, the applicant shall hire a police detail based on a rec and on recommendations um, after discussions with the chief. Uh, That's fine. I, I would just want it to be stronger that they shall contact the police okay. chief and that they shall follow okay. his recommendation. So I'm, I'll amend my motion to remove that last bullet that's on the DCG comments and say the applicant shall contact the police chief regarding police details. Details shall be um, recommended by the chief. Will that suffice, Mr. Carpenter, for an amendment? Yeah, as long as they're following the chief's recommendation. Yeah. That's and it's okay. up to them to contact the chief. Okay. And you're comfortable with that uh, motion? I am. Okay. I'm very happy with that motion. All right. And Sharon, have you got that? Okay. So the motion has been made and seconded. Is there any further discussion? Being none, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. And would you please notify Sheldon's that that uh, has been uh, taken care of and with the restrictions of the uh, the time on it, please? Mr. Chairman, if I may, I'd also like to just when we notify them, acknowledge that out of a courtesy, we, we um, went forward with the license due to the emergency, mm -hmm. but in all other circumstances, all other cases, they are required to be here. Thank you, Mrs. Goodrich. Thank you. Okay, now we go to item 5I, 
Mr. Chairman, can I ask a question? Yes. I see the town planner here. I don't know if he's here for an item. If if he is, if we need to move it up just so that he can. Okay. It's quarter of nine, so. Well, I will ask uh, Mr. Benoit, have you got anything else on the agenda here that you. Uh... Yes, I see an E. I'm going to go out of the list. Uh, through the chair, my, my, I'm assuming that uh, Mr. Benoit just was here just to listen to the update on item uh, 6C, but doesn't need to certainly stay for it. Is there, was there anything else, ma'am? That... No. Oh, sorry, the open space? Sorry, it was 6B. Yep. Okay, can we move up items 6B and 6C, please? So moved. Second. All of the favor? Aye. 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 Thank you. Okay. 6B, notice on approval of 2016 open space and recreation plan. Uh, through the chair, just wanted to notify the board that after uh, much work on behalf of the town planner and the uh, assistant town planner, now our energy manager primarily, um, the open space and recreation plan has received approval from the state. We received preliminary approval, I believe, in November of 14, and a lot of work had to be done after that. We rejuvenated the open space and recreation committee and working with the planning department um, under uh, Matt and Eric, they were able to complete all of the revisions that the state required and additions that the state required, and the approval is in place. And this isn't a significant approval because it means that once you have that in place, and it has not been in place here, I don't know when the last time it was, um, it was the 2006 plan was never approved. But having an approved plan allows us, uh, makes us eligible for applying to the Department of Conservation and Recreation for grants. So it opens up a potential funding door to seek grants for um, various recreational activities as the state deems eligible. So I want to thank the Open Space and Recreation uh, Committee for working on this. Really want to thank Matt and Eric because they put a lot of time and energy into this, as did our, our former town planner who spent a couple of years on it. And many of you actually came to some of those public hearings. So it's finally drawing to a close. The plan, once approved, is good for a period of five years. So it's approved through 2021, at which point we would start the process all over again. At that point, hopefully it won't be such a long process because the plan is updated it's comprehensive and it shouldn't take as long to do. So, thank you. Okay. Do you want to add anything? Thank you. Matt, please. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just would like to go on record and thank Eric Lesperance for some of the hard research on a uh, inventory table of all the town's open space parcels that needed to be updated in several uh, varieties, and he did a, a great amount of research. I just wanted to recognize him for his, his efforts formally. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Under a 6C. Update on the status of the community compact, the economic development plan, and housing plan. Right. Uh, through the chair, I uh, wanted to just give the board a brief update. As you, I believe uh, you know, because you had voted on this and we had the contract in place at the last meeting, we did receive a grant for $25,000 um, from the Executive Office of Economic and Community Development to hire a consultant to assist the town with the uh, creation of an economic development plan, which would then be incorporated into the master plan. That was one of our best practices. One of them was to, the other one was to uh, create a housing plan. And I was notified last week, or about two weeks ago, that it is not official until it's signed, but that we have been, we will be, uh, we're in the process of getting the paperwork done for another $25,000 grant. Uh, it's called a PATH grant, which is um, uh, Pathways Toward, um, uh, toward Housing. And it is through the um, D, uh, Department of Housing and Community Development, which is a division within EOECD. And it's another $25,000 grant, which will allow us to hire a consultant to help us with the economic development plan. So um, in order to make sure we move the process along, we put out a request for quotes for housing, excuse me, for the economic development plan, because we had that grant signed. So we received three proposals, and we're in the process of reviewing 
reviewing them and hopefully make a decision by the end of the week. And uh, hopefully by the end of this week, I've been working on the request for proposals for the housing plan, but don't want to release it until we've signed that grant. It just seems premature to put the request out until the grant has been executed. And you have already taken that vote in advance in anticipation of it, so we're just waiting for the documents from the state. So we're very excited. Um, we got some great proposals to work on the economic development plan. I have no doubt we're going to get some great proposals from some consultants for the housing plan, and we should be able to move these things along. So it, it's good news. We're, we're excited. Great. Thank you very much. Any comments? Okay. Um, now I guess we'll go back to where we were. Uh, gift acceptances. Have we got anything else you want to move up? Uh, through the chat, I was just going to ask, Matt, I'm sorry, did you? Uh, Here's the warrant. Okay, okay, okay. Just making sure. Okay. So the warrant is... Now we can move that up if you like. Um, that'll be uh, the vote on the special town meeting, and that'll be under 5K. So moved. So move up second. item 5K. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, we move up. Uh, this is the vote on the fall special town meeting. Uh, vote to set the date for the fall special town meeting on Tuesday, October 18th, 2016, 7 o'clock. Is there a motion? Mr. Chairman, I will make a motion to open the warrant and to close the warrant on Monday, August 22nd, 2016. Do we have a time at 7 p.m.? Um, Through the chair, you, uh, I guess we're going to take item one first. We'll okay. Right, first. You need to vote yep. first. We need to vote first on uh, the set the date. I will make a motion that we set the date for the fall special town meeting as Tuesday, October 18th, 2016 at 7 p.m. Okay. Is there a second? Second. Okay. All those in favor? Uh, Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Now we have a vote to open the warrant. Mr. Chairman, I move that we open the warrant. Second. Motion and main second to open the warrant for the special town meeting. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? And also, uh, item three, to vote to close the warrant. And that recommend the vote to close the warrant on Monday, August 22nd, 2016 at five o'clock. That's fine. At five o'clock. At five o'clock. And through the chair, if I can just point out that we've, we've extended this. Uh, we used to keep it open for a week. We're keeping it open for two weeks. We've tried to back everything up to give people more opportunity to okay. submit more articles. <laughs> so there's a motion to uh, close the warrant on uh, Monday, October, August 22nd, 2016 at 5 o'clock. So moved. Is there a second? Second. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Okay. So we're all set. So now we'll go back to our gift acceptances. We have uh, a couple here tonight. One for the police department, the Greater Worcester Community Foundation, $3,500. And uh, this comes from the Worcester Community Foundation Incorporated and their operating account. And uh, this is going to be have you got any info, more information on this, Ms. Jacobson? Uh, through the chair, this came in uh, to the chief of police and the attachment is all that we received. It's, it's um, fairly, uh, okay. the information is all there. It's $3,500. It comes from a Lester Savings Bank Fund that is uh, managed by the Greater Lister Community Foundation. And it is in honor of the Auburn Police Department in memory of Fallen Officer Ron Tarantino. Yes. Okay. Is there a motion? Mrs. Brotherton. Mr. Chair, I'd like to make a motion that we accept with gratitude for people's continued support in memory of our officer. Second. Okay. Motion been made and seconded. All those in favor? Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Uh, for the Fire Rescue Department, we have a couple here. Uh, one from Paul and Susan Bento, $100. We'll take these all together. Um, we've got one from Tommy and Patty Mancuso for $50. Um, let's see. Is 
Is this a duplicate? I believe it might be. We got from the Tommy and Patty Mankiw show, and then uh, we've got that again. Is that a duplicate? Through the chair, I'm assuming it's a duplicate because it's uh, they're both given the same number. Okay. All right. So the you have a, a duplicate from Tommy and Patty Mancuso in our uh, packets tonight, and then the last one's going to be from James Conway for twenty-five dollars. Is there a motion? Motion to accept with gratitude. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. And let's see. We have item. I three yeah. development okay. and inspection department for the Kathleen Sabina animal compound twenty dollars from Richard Dumas. Motion to accept with gratitude. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. And now for the Auburn Public Library, we have several. Um, Tefta Pajani and Nancy P. O'Coin, a member of PETA Petro, $100. And that's for designated use of gifts and books and library use. From Barbara Booth, $50 in memory of Peter G. Petro, $50 for books and library use. Stephen J. Cott and Linda A. Cott, $50 in memory of Peter G. Pedro, Pedro um, books for miscellaneous library use. Again, from Marsha Booth and Earl Booth in memory of Peter Petro, $100. And from Andrew R. Petro and Florence L. Petro, in memory of Peter Petro, $500 for books and library use. Is there a motion? Motion, we accept them with gratitude. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. Okay. Now we have um, subcommittee proposed policies. The first one, proclamation and recognition policies. And I'll turn this over to our members of the subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We, um, we met again and really fine-tuned some of the policies, um, specifically the proclamation and recognition policies, the recognition of town employees, indoor entertainment license, outdoor entertainment license, and extension of outdoor liquor license to patio and outdoor areas. We've um, taken the board's comments into consideration and have tweaked these. We're hoping, you know, rather than just sending back and forth to the um, subcommittee, we really have worked out on these policies and we respectfully request a vote on these tonight. I'm going to ask Mr. Brotherton to um, discuss the first two, which are the proclamation and recognition policies and the recognition of town um, employees. And we do have just a template, mm -hmm. you know, that goes with that. Okay, the first one on the proclamations um, that we started, and once again, I'm echoing Mrs. Uh, Goodrich that you have all had input that we've all taken into consideration. We felt as though the fair thing to do for proclamations was A, would be for um, only Auburn residents and or Auburn events, businesses at 25, 50 years continuously in the town of Auburn, an individual who performs a life-saving act, but other than a pay public safety worker. D, any person receiving military honors that fall between the Medal of Honor and the Purple Heart. E, an achievement at a national level, whether it be an individual or a team. F, an achievement at the state level, once again, either as a team or an individual. G, Eagle Scouts and Girl, Eagle Scout Awards, excuse me, and Girl Scout Golden Awards. Um, those are the ones that we came up for proclamations. Um, I know that we're trying to condense and we thought this was a, a good place. 
I guess one, I'm sorry, Mr. President. I guess my question on D is uh, honors that fall between the Medal of Honor and the Purple Heart. Uh, I'm not familiar with what those are, and um, how do we determine that? The, the, if I may, Mr. Chairman, those, sure. those are ones that came in um, when we had discussed it at our last. We we can certainly bring the list, but okay. um, Selectman Simonian was on the board at the time, and there was um, it was really to recognize um, military heroes, and so we did the research. We can we can provide that. But we do have. Yeah, we do have. The, okay. We do. Yes. yes. All right. At, at one of our meetings. Great. Thank you. Okay. Our citations, um, which this is a, a template of one that we, and I'm sorry. I we went, can just pass it around. Just just, one. I'm just going to pass it sure, around. A, a sample uh, citation certificate. We would like to honor those um, ribbon, ribbon cutting grand openings. Just so you can see. Wedding anniversaries, the wedding must be 50 years or more with one of the recipients being a lifetime resident of Auburn. Is that understandable? <laughs> okay, and C under citations were by request 90th, 95th, or the 100th birthday of town residents. Letters of our appreciation, A, the reinvestment of any abandoned, foreclosed, or existing businesses, anything else as appropriate, appropriate approved by the majority vote of the board. Any comments? I have one, I have one more. Okay. Mr. Holstrom, I'm sorry. Um, recognition of town employees oh, okay. and boards and commission members. All employee, board, and commission recognitions will be held one time per year during National Public Service Recogni Recognition Week, which is customarily in the first week of May. Subcommittee recommends the following guidelines from the National Public Service Rec Recognition Week to recognize town employees and boards and commission members to include retirements, departures, and resignations from a board in general increments of five years, beginning every five years, beginning at the 10 year. What our employees would receive. Uh, I'm hoping you got a copy of the letter in the packet. I'm assuming you did. Um, I didn't see it. You didn't? Oh, okay. Oh, that's, okay. Oh, that's I'm sorry. Okay. Um, public servants, past and present, deserve our respect and appreciate the appreciation throughout the year. We hope to continue honoring them for their service and for many great challenges they tackle on behalf every day in our hometown and community. Celebrated the first week of May since 1985, Public Service Recognition Week is organized annually by the Public Employees Roundtables and its member organizations to recognize our men and women who have served our community and those who continue to serve. We thank all of our individuals and organizations that help a town. Please join us the first week of May. This week is designated by Congress as Public Service Recogni Recognition Week, and we at the Auburn Town Hall want to thank you for all that you do in service to our town. Now more than ever, you and your fellow residents are being asked to do more with less. While tackling increasingly complex issues for our town, we at the Town Hall value your commitment and thank you for all that you do. And that would accompany the invitation. And I apologize. Water. <laughs> <laughs> it's getting dry at 9 o'clock. Yeah. Okay. Um, the first one we're going to uh, look at is the vote. Uh, yeah. 
is the proclamation and recognition policies. Uh, we'll take that first. Mrs. Goodrich. Mr. Chairman, if I can, I, and I apologize, I worked with Sharon on this, and I just want to point something out. Um, this is just a template for the um, citation of achievement. So the, the thought was, and we discussed it in the past, the chairman of the board would sign it, but all members would be listed. So this will change a little bit. Like, it would be a script signature. All, all members of the board would be listed, but it would have the chairman's signature. Okay. I just wanted to point that out before you took a vote on this. Okay. Thank you. Yes, Mr. Carpenter. Mr. Chairman, uh, I know Mrs. Goodrich wants a vote, but I would ask, I have not looked at indoor, I have not looked at outdoor. Um, we're, we're only on the top two. I understand, but I would like a little more time with this. I did get a chance to go through it a couple times. I do have some comments or some additions, and I'd just like to a uh, chance to go through it. Certainly would uh, be happy to, if the board would be amenable to allow us to have it at the next regular meeting. And I will make sure that anything that I have is submitted in advance of that so that we can all review it. So you're gonna make that the form of a motion? That would be, if uh, that is an order, Mr. Chairman, I would make a motion that we hold this to the September 12th meeting. Okay. So uh, there's a motion made to hold this to the September 12th meeting. That's for proclamation and recognition policies. Is there a second? Second. Okay, so the motion's been made in second. Is there any further discussion? Mr. Chairman, I'll just comment that, um, that I hope that we do take a vote on this. It's gone back and forth to the subcommittee. We've taken um, comments into consideration, um, and I do hope that we vote on this on the next meeting if we hold this. Okay, so the motion's been made and seconded for uh, holding this until the September 12th meeting. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? Okay, it's a vote. And on item two, recognition of the town employees, boards, and commission members. Mr. Chairman, that was taken as one. Um, well, was that taken as one, or you wanted to um, make that motion for two? It was presented as one. Okay, good. I have the, the two separate here. Right. But I'll be happy to make the, a separate motion that we hold it till September 12th. Okay. If that cleans it up. Yeah, that, if that, that, that'll clean it up for okay. us. Okay. So you want to hold that one also to September yes. 12th? Which one are we on? Uh, item 2, J2. Okay. Yes. Do I need to second it? Oh, you second that one. Uh, okay. Well, I'll second it, but my, I guess my comment was, aren't we including all five of these? Is, is that what the intent is? Well, no, what we're going to do is going to go each one. Each one we're going to yeah, make discuss them and find out what we want to do with them. If board members may want to vote on a particular one tonight, so we'll take them one by one. Okay. So the motion's been made to uh, hold uh, item J2 until September 12th. Second. So there is a second. Is there any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Now we go to... J3, which is the Indoor Entertainment License, and I'll refer to the uh, subcommittee. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this is a um, this is a very comprehensive indoor entertainment license. We, I, you know, we've talked about this. We don't currently have any business in town that would necessarily. Um, need this, you know, comprehensive indoor entertainment license. Um, I worked with Lieutenant Moss um, some time ago on this. We brought it to the board, um, and I'll point out specifically because I'm remembering it. Um, Mr. Chairman, you had um, a concern under safety as to who would have access, and we took those um, comments into consideration under D, which I realize we need to... Um, Letter, those D, yep. E, F, G. Okay. Um, those were, you know, who shall have that exclusive control of the facility. Um, so, again, this is, um, we've gone back and forth with this one, taking the comments into consideration, um, address those that were brought to our attention by the board members. Um, 
although I'm the one that's asking for a vote on this, I'm going to ask that this be hold just so we can correct that typo. Under safety, it would be A, B, C, D, E, F, and then G. Okay. Through the chair, if you want yes. to make the motion to do it with the correction, we'll okay. make the correction tomorrow All if right. you don't want to hold it for that. So, I, you know, I don't know how board members feel about this. Um, again, comprehensive um, has gone before the... Um, had some input from the bylaw review committee. Um, both fire chief and police chief have um, had some input on this as well as board members. So again, this is a policy that's just kind of been out there that I would like to adopt something. I'd like to support that. The, uh, the document uh, falls along with the bylaws that uh, you have worked with and it spells out a lot of the questions that, uh, and concerns of anybody uh, for an indoor entertainment license and would spell out uh, what they would have to do and what their uh, requirements are. Mr. Carpenter? Mr. Chairman, this is the first time I've seen this. Actually, these last three is the first time I've seen them. I don't know if prior to my joining the board they were brought up. I don't know, but they are very, very involved. I would ask uh, and make a motion that we hold it till September 12th. Okay, there's Second. a motion made and seconded to hold this until September 12th. Is there any other questions or comments? Being none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay. Uh, we have an outdoor entertainment license. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So this was um, this was actually um, a policy that is much needed and we don't have in place right now. If I, if a um, license holder serves alcohol and they serve it outdoors, they need, um, I'm sorry, I'm jumping ahead of myself here. This is for um, the outdoor entertainment licenses similar to what we're providing for um, Sheldon's. Again, it is a brand new policy. Um, it's been in our packet. I'm not necessarily asking that we we adopt this tonight, but if anyone has any comments on it, I would appreciate them so that we can have a policy to vote on at the next meeting. Again, this is a brand new, from scratch, we, um, we did work with the town manager. Um, I, well, I spoke with the town manager and then brought it back to the to Denise when we worked as a subcommittee. Um, adopted some things from different towns, and um, you know, something that we put into it that we felt was important was, you know, compliance and enforcement and revocation. So I hope that members had the opportunity, you know, um, to look at their packets over the weekend and just have something. So, any comments as to um, the again, work we did on this? I would, I would support moving that forward tonight. Uh, I've had a chance to look through this. It follows along with bylaws. It does take a look at uh, a lot of concerns and a lot of the uh, requirements that somebody would need to uh, keep this in place and keep their uh, entertainment under control. And I believe that this uh, would, document would do it. Uh, like any other um, document, like any other um, event, uh, there are unique circumstances, but uh, I believe this spells it out. And uh, for the, uh, in general, of uh, an outdoor entertainment license, I believe this covers it. So I would support this. So, so and um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And if it, if the motion is to hold it, um, please, um, you know, send your your comments to Sharon early enough that we can all read them. Potentially look at. adopting them into this policy so that we can take a vote on this at our next meeting. It is important. Okay, Mr. Carpenter. I'm going to make a motion. This is the first time I've seen it. I got two days to look at it. I know this has been a topic that the former chair has brought up, but I've never seen anything. So as I pledge to do, I will do. I will make sure that my comments are ahead of time. But I had two days to review it. It is comprehensive, and I want to make sure we're getting it right. So I appreciate the subcommittee's work, as I've said numerous times. But I'm going to ask that we hold it till September 12th. Second. Okay, so the motion has been made and seconded. Any further discussion? Being none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. 
And now for item J5, the extension of the outdoor liquor license to the patio and outdoor areas. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And this is, again, would be a, um, it would be a new policy for the board, although um, it's been clear on any license holders um, license that in order to serve alcohol outdoors, they must have a separate license for that. So um, when we adopt this policy, what, be it what we've suggested or amended at our next meeting, I think it's important because liquor licenses are renewed in the end of November, am I correct? So we'll be sending notice out soon. We'll send them out at the end of November and they're, they begin a they have to go to the ABCC by December. And okay, so once. so I think it's you know I think that we may have a couple license holders who who may not be aware of this, and so I would hope that we can adopt this policy by sept our September meeting, and then include this in all um, license holders renewal packet so that they are aware that before they serve alcohol alcohol outdoors, they need to come before us again. We've worked hard on these um, to, to ensure that um, we're meeting all state requirements and looking out for the residents as well. Okay. Mr. Carpenter. Mr. Chairman, to be consistent, I'll make a motion we hold it till September 12th. Second. Okay. So the motion remains second to go to September 12th with item J5. Uh, is there any other discussion, comments? Being none, all those in favor? Uh, Aye. Opposed? Okay. And the last one, Mr. The last one, Mr. Chairman. Um, we do have the one that we're working on. We had some bullets, and we just put so much work into these. We just felt we hadn't had a policy, but it's on the um, code of conduct, and it was just a matter of putting it together. But as you can see, so much work went into this that we can have that probably available and for I the next. And I appreciate all the work the subcommittee's done on this. It uh, looks like you've uh, done a lot of research, and uh, you worked with a lot of uh, different people to uh, make this happen so I do appreciate all your work thank you okay we're gonna go to um, let's see 5L there's no proclamations tonight we have a drain layers license for Crescent Builders of West Boylston yeah. this one here is a uh, They've uh, given us our, they've been previously licensed uh, within the past five years. Um, we have the approval of the superintendent, Bill Coyle, and they are Crescent Builders from 94 North Main Street in West Boylston. Uh, they also have a certificate of liability insurance that appears to be up to date. Is there any uh, motion? Questions. Mr. Chairman, I'm happy to make a motion to approve the license provided that all requirements of the state and town and any of the departments, boards, and commissions have been fulfilled. Said license is subject to all the conditions stated upon it. Failure to comply with any and all the conditions shall invalidate the license and render it null and void. This is for Crescent Builders, Inc. of West Boylston, Mass. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Motion been made and seconded. Is there any discussion? Being none, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Okay, under 6D, we have the fiscal year 16 legal analysis, and you should have a copy of that in your packets. Hopefully had a chance to review it. And uh, Ms. Jacobson. Thank you, uh, through the chair. Uh, for our newest member, uh, the board had suggested that the town administration provide a report to them on a regular basis. So for the last three or four years, I've been providing an annual report on the legal expenditures for the prior fiscal year. So that's what you have before you. So, um, and the dates here are, are significant in that uh, they asked me to start doing it from the first year that I started in FY11. I would then went back and got some data from a couple of years before then to show a basis of comparison. So we're actually showing from FY09 forward. So I'm um, very excited to say that the total legal expenditures for FY16, the year that just ended, um, were $97,775,000. That includes town council, who was our general council as well, at $87,799, and labor council at $9,976. 
Uh, I think it's significant to note that over the eight year period from 09 to 16, that FY total legal expenditures in 16 now are 69.71% less than they were back in FY09. And there is a 60% de decrease in the six year period from FY11 to FY16. I just want to point out on town council, the expenditures of 87799 is an eight-year decrease from FY11 of 31.4%, and the total expenditures have decreased every year until last year, FY15, and if you recall, last year they had gone up a little bit because we were in the process of finalizing the general bylaw review, and the general bylaw review took a lot of time for uh, the town council to review. I also want to point out that many of, the, and I'll go through that in a minute, but most of the issues that town council deals with are issues that have to be dealt with when there are appeals of zoning decisions or planning decisions. Um, and again, we anticipate moving forward, town council is going to have to be actively involved again with the zoning bylaw review. Your zoning, any potential revisions, changes, anything to your zoning bylaws have to review by town council first. So we anticipate, while we've been able to keep the cost down and actually decrease the cost, um, just want to mention that the years that we do these major undertakings with regard to our bylaws, there is a, a cost to that. But it's great news because the cost did go down. Um, Attachment, if you can see, attachment four shows the town council expenditures by category. And this kind of explains what I was just saying as to what types of things that we spend money on. Um, inspectional services is a, a major piece of it. The largest piece is litigation, as you can see. And that's something that, you know, when, when somebody questions a decision or appeals a decision, there is a cost to that. Um, Southhold Road, a small amount for the school department this year, and that was the middle school. Uh, anything under charter bylaws or reorganization, that's usually just a determination by somebody as to what the charter is. You still need to have legal determination on certain sections of the charter that come up every now and then. It's rare right now. It, it happened more um, when the charter first passed. So um, I also want to point out that, let's see, the primary legal matters uh, came to 84%, and that's zoning enforcement and appeals at 196 Leicester Street. So if you look at this, really, on, under the legal matters related to zoning enforcement appeals, 196 Leicester Street is the bulk of it, and that is a property that we're in litigation with on a number of different issues. Um, I'll, I won't go through all of these, but you can see in here how the costs break down based on the properties and where the issues are. Um, labor Council expenditures, which is our, uh, DeMoscus is our Labor Council, and first I, I should have said this initially, I just want to thank and acknowledge Town Council uh, Robert Hannigan and Labor Council DeMoscus. They're tremendous. They give us fantastic service. Um, they've done a great job by the town, and we're grateful to have them. So when you see the decrease in their expenditures, it's not because they're not doing a good job. It's because you know, hopefully we're doing a lot of, uh, of things internally that we weren't doing before, which I can explain in a minute, and we're trying to keep those costs low for the taxpayers. But when we do need to turn to legal counsel, we do it cautiously, but we do it when we need to do it because we want to protect the town. And when we do, both of those attorneys are excellent. Um, Labor Council expenditures in FY16 totaled $9,976, uh, which is a 58% decrease over last year. I want to point out that I think this is extremely significant in that we started negotiations and actually finished the majority of negotiations um, in FY16. So our Labor Council bill for negotiations this year was about $160. We, we made one call to, it uh, could have been too, we made one call to Labor Council with regard to uh, labor negotiations that we wanted to be sure on something. The rest of it was all done internally. And I would tell you that we track the number of hours that we put into negotiations, into the preparation of the MOAs, into um, the actual research and preparation that used to be done by Labor Council. And it's now all done internally. And when I took a look at it this afternoon, in anticipation of coming in tonight, we've saved um, um, it, it's an estimated amount, but based on the time that we've put in, uh, based on the rate that Labor Council would have charged, we would have spent about $156,000 this year in legal fees, and we spent, as I said, under $200. So I, I want to thank uh, 
all the members of the town administration, but particularly Ed Kazanovich, uh, who joined me in all of the negotiations. He and I were at the table for all 10 units, which we've, I'm happy to uh, report, we have come to agreement at the table with all 10. Nine have ratified, and the 10th vote is scheduled at the end of this week. Uh, so we're hoping that um, we'll be all done with that. So we will also, I want to thank the unions themselves because working with us and sitting at the table and actually listening to what our concerns are and having us have the opportunity to listen to what the union's concerns are, we're making incredible progress. It's a positive environment, and I think it helps both uh, the union and the town understand what some of the issues are and address those issues. It's not always monetary. It's things that need to be changed to make operations run smoother. So I want to thank the unions for working with us to keep those costs down. We settled, again, all, all ten contracts have come to agreement and nine have been ratified with no arbitration and uh, no mediation. The um, just the last thing I want to point out is that in the uh, six-year period, let's see, Labor Council has decreased significantly. Um, if you look at um, again, the, the average cost during years of negotiation, so every three years, the average cost for Labor Council were probably $120,000. So when we estimate that this year would have been about 150, 156. That's probably right in the ballpark based on what I've seen for past figures. But Labor Council expenditures uh, over the eight-year period from FY09 through FY16 have gone down 90.26 percent. And over it is. It's um, and again when, when we need to turn to Labor Council, they are fantastic. We get a lot of a lot of legal expertise for our dollar from that firm. They're wonderful. They've done a great job. But we're also glad that we've been able to keep the cost down for the taxpayer. So okay. Thank you for that. Thank you for that report. That's uh, definitely a plus for us. And um, well, thank you for all your work. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there any comments or questions? Great job. Okay. Thank Great you. job. Mm -hmm. Uh, under the town manager item 6E, agreement with Blue Wave Capital for payment of for damages to Kelly Street. Uh, through the chair. Uh, as you may or may not be aware, um, if you live in the area, I'm sure you're aware, there is a uh, solar project going on on Barrett Street in Oxford. And through the process of building that solar facility in Oxford, the company that is doing the building, which is um, BWC Stillwater River LLC and BWC French River LLC, and those are just the legal terms. Collectively, they're, they are um, B BWC, which is Blue Wave Capital. They're, they were using Kelly Street as their sole access to the site. There was no access in and out of the site. So if you can imagine, an enormous, I think I could be wrong, but I believe it's a six megawatt facility. It's large. And those trucks every day, all day, coming up and down the street. We had several calls from residents on Kelly Street complaining about the time, um, the noise, the trucks, some of the damage being done to the street. And I had reached out to the owners. Um, I know our town planner had had a com couple of conversations. Darlene Coyle had had a couple of conversations because of the complaints that were coming in. And I have to say that they were open to talking to us. I also reached out to the town manager in Oxford to see if there was any way that their hours of operation under their planning board site approval could match the town of Auburn's hours of operation for construction because they're using Auburn to get there. Um, and the board. They didn't want to go back and redo their site plan approval, but the company did agree to follow the hours of operation of Oxford, which were similar to Auburn. They were a little bit longer. I believe ours ended at 4 and theirs ended at 6. Um, I could be off by a half hour. but. They they kept those hours pretty well. A couple of times we got a complaint that a truck went up the road at 6 in the morning. We called the company and immediately they let us know that it was a secondary vendor who didn't know the hours. And um, At one point during the conversation, the owner of BWC suggested to me that they hold a uh, community meeting. And it was a great idea and it went very well. 
I do wish, and he, I believe they do too, that they had done it early in the process rather than, you know, being reactive, be more proactive and, and do it earlier. But again, the, process, the project wasn't an Auburn project. It was in Oxford. We have to respect that. And they did a great job. They held a community meeting. They answered the questions of the residents. The residents were happy that they held the meeting. The um, construction ended. Uh, well, it's still dribs and drabs finishing now, but primarily it's been done this week. Um, so as a result, Bill Coyle, our DPW director, had figured out what the damage was to Kelly Street. Granted, Kelly Street is going to be repaved. We're going to be starting that probably at the end of this month. Um, it was not in good condition to start, but the truck damage and all the heavy equipment that they brought up and down made it worse in many spots. So um, we worked and negotiated with uh, BWC, and they agreed to pay us $15,000 toward that road construction to cover the damages that they had done. Uh, and we, Bill Coyle and myself, feel that's very fair. We're grateful to them for entering into that agreement. I just wanted you to have a copy of that agreement so you'd um, see that we will be getting funding to come in toward that. And again, that, that repaving should start at the end of August. This agreement just applies to this one project. They may be doing another project down the road, um, in which case we'll keep our eye on it as to what roads they intend to use to access their site, and we hope it won't be solely through Auburn again. But um, I do have to say the company, when we reached out to them, was very good to work with. Great. And uh, the town of Oxford was good to work with as well. Thank you. Mrs. Goodrich. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So, um, so um, my comments may not be as positive as Mrs. Jacobson's. She knows that um, I've had many conversations with her as, as um, well as the residents. Um, well, I commend her and Mr. Coyle, and I had a conversation with him about this $15,000. You know, I, I don't personally believe that it's adequate to cover the potential long-term damage that was done to Prospect Street, Hill Street, and Kelly Street, especially when they clear-cut the property up there. And we had these enormous trucks on Prospect Street that was recently paved. Um, with um, you know the logs and then the continuous um, equipment trucks coming up, you know I heard from residents constantly. Again, to their credit, Mrs. Jacobson said you know they would follow um, the hours of operation that we have, but they followed them for a short time and then kind of got eased up on that. And then we'd get complaints from the residents and then. Um, she would contact them again and it would be nice but you know the residents really it was it was terrible for the residents up there with these trucks at six o'clock in the morning these loud rigging trucks and um, I'm, I'm glad the project is over my 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 disappointment is in Oxford I I understand the process but I just still don't get how a planning board in Oxford can give approval to a project and with conditions and the only entrance and access to the property is through Auburn and its streets. I know that we were given formal, like, you know, a butter information, but it would have been nice if we had been included in the process a little bit more as to um, being informed that they were going to put conditions on and the only access was in Auburn. So again, you know, I, I'm happy with the 15,000. 15,000 is better than nothing. Um, I hope that if they ever do a project in Auburn or in a surrounding town that we are a little more proactive. Um, when I say we, them, with these neighborhoods, um, again, Mrs. Jacobson knows, um, meant because I I live up there, you know, I'm not going to hide it. Residents reached out to me, and it was just, it was just terrible what they were dealing with. It wasn't, it didn't, you know, I wasn't a direct abutter, but I know the area well, and um, the people in those few homes right there, it was just, it was just really disruptive to their quality of life, and. Um, Again, I'm sure that they're pleased that the project is nearing completion. And through the chair, um, Mrs. Goodrich is right. That it, was, it was tough for that neighborhood. Uh, when I did have a conversation with the town manager in Oxford, I asked that for all future projects now, should anything like this ever happen again, that uh, I respectfully would request that they would reach out to us and let us know that they're 
considering a project that only has access through our town, then I felt additional outreach should have been made at the time by their planning board. And the town manager, when I say they were good to do it, he agreed that that's something that they need to look at. We should have had the courtesy of more notification rather than finding out through residents who are getting woken up at 6 in the morning every day. And um, as Mrs. Goodrich said, the company would go on for a while and then you get a subcontractor who would come in and not know. And they were responsive the minute you call, but you had to keep calling. So I, I hope we don't have to go through this process again. Okay, can we, um, I guess, be a little proactive now uh, that we've dealt with Oxford? Can we get a hold of Milbury, Lester, Worcester? and let them know that uh, we've had this incident and that uh, if anything is to happen like that, just to please notify us. Okay. okay. Thank you very much. Oh, I'm sorry, Mr. No, Berthium. I, I just, um, everything I'm, I've read about, you know, what seems to be the damage and everything else, I, I just can't even, Fathom that fifteen thousand dollars is even close to being payment for for what's gone on. So, uh, I mean, how did we come up with fifteen thousand dollars? And is that kind of uh, you know we we missed the boat somewhere? So we're just kind of settling for that? Or I mean, if if they used our roads and damaged our roads and everything else. All indications of everything I've ever known is fifteen thousand dollars to barely get you a driveway. So how how did we come up with fifteen thousand and and um, you know is that through the goodness of their heart or is is there something that we should be talking to um, to legal about? Uh, through the chair, we did go. Um, we did talk to legal counsel about this before we signed into the agreement. So that it was checked with uh, legal counsel. Uh, Bill Coyle, who's the DPW director, calculated that amount based on the damages that were done on top of the damage that was already there when the project started. The road was not in good condition when the project started. So legally, we can't be charging another company to cover some of the costs that we were going to incur anyway. So he had to be very careful to look at the damage that the trucks had done, which was primarily on the shoulders sections of the road, the center section of the road um, didn't sustain that type of damage by the trucks. It was damaged prior to that. It was on the list for paving anyway. So we have to be careful not to be going after a company to cover some of the costs that we were going to incur anyway. So it was, a, it was a bit of a challenge to come up with a dollar figure. We can't ask them to pave the whole road because it had been on there prior to that anyway. It had been listed, it had already been shown that it was something that we were going to be done, and it had already gone out to bid actually for that part of the road. So um, Mr. Coyle did do the calculations and he did it based on um, per square mile. As you said, it wouldn't do a whole driveway for $15,000 depending on the size of the driveway, but the problem was Kelly Street was in poor shape to start with. Um, had it been in good shape, it would have been easier to calculate what the damages were from the trucks versus what the damages were prior to the trucks getting there. And that, that was a challenging street. Well, I guess uh, just to follow up to that question, if um, we monitored the roads or Prospect Street, uh, Hill Street, um, and the roads deteriorate earlier than expected, can we go back to them and say, you know what, this is, no. I don't know, it's kind of a difficult thing to... That's what I disagree with. Yeah, so this, this is we're signing off to, to no further litigation and I you know as far as I'm concerned they gave us a kiss on the cheek and we're supposed to accept it and I do not like this one bit uh, through the chair we cannot go back it is specific to this project if there is another project there you can go back if the agreement was just with the company specific to their work at the site we wouldn't have been able to go back we would have been stuck. So by making it specific to the project that ended on July 2016, so we added that language. So everyone knows the project that ended July of 2016 caused this damage. If they continue to do anything, if they continue there past July 16, uh, 2016, that's another whole um, process because it's my understanding there could potentially be another phase. So we wanted to protect the town and not say for anything that happened at that site because that site could be an ongoing process for years. There could be another project down the road. There's hundreds of acres up there. Mm -hmm. Oh, comment? 
There's hundreds of acres up there. Okay. Available for future. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Your comments have been so noted, Mr. Berthium. Thank you. Um, is there anything else on that one? Okay. Being none, we go to uh, item 6F. It's a board vote on authorization and acceptance of grant funds for the St. Vincent, Vincent Health Care Grant for $1,000. And you have that in your packet in front of you. Yep. Ms. Jacobson. Thank you, through the chair. This is, um, uh, we have applied for this and received it in the past. There is no match. It's $1,000, and it offsets the cost of transportation for some of our um, vulnerable uh, and disabled residents in town. The application, while we've been told we would get $1,000, the, um, the application that's the amount that we're, we're aiming for. I believe in the past we, we were around $1,200, uh, but the, we have not applied yet. The application is due at the end of August, and that is the amount that they've indicated that we should be applying for. Okay. And this is, uh, the application must be returned by August 31st. When will we know uh, what the uh, grant reception is going to be? Um, through the chair, I think once the application is in, it doesn't take that long to turn it around because the dollar amount's already been identified by them, so. Great. Okay. Uh, any questions? Yes, Mrs. President. I'd like to make a motion. Sure. Um, I'd like to make a, a motion that we support the um, application for um, the St. Vincent Community Center Health Care that would help support our transportation to the Auburn Senior Center. Okay, motion been made. Second. It's been seconded. Any further discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Thank you. Okay. On uh, 6G, an update on foreclosed property disposition. Ms. Jacobson. Uh, through the chair, I just wanted to give the board um, an update. If you recall, I believe in January of 14, um, as one of the goals you had given me was to look at um, moving forward on the disposition of certain town-owned property. And as part of that report that we had mentioned, that we would be looking at a way to start to dispose of properties that came in through tax title. So we have entered into a contract with the Zikos Group auctioneers, um, which is on the state bid list for the disposition through auction of certain um, foreclosed tax title properties. And the Zico's group, as you can see from the memo, has a lot of experience. Um, this year alone, I think they're working with, to have auctions this year with maybe 15 different communities. But some of the communities they've had them with in the past uh, two, two, three, four years, they've, they've been around for several years include um, Hope Till, Charlton, Natick, Rentham, Framingham, Averill, Dalton, Chelsea, Carlisle, Wareham, Webster, Wilburn, Rowley, Revere, Avon, Maynard, Brockton, Chelmsford, Foxborough, Southbridge, Leicester, South Hadley, Bourne, Grafton, Essex, Malden, Situate, Athol, and North Brookfield. Those are just some in the last two years that they've done um, auctions for. The contract is for one year, uh, starting in July and going through next July 21st, with the option of two additional one-year extensions. Um, the Our intent is to identify those foreclosed properties, first of all, in the first round of this, that have potential value. First of all, value in not just monetary, but the town doesn't want to hold on to vacant properties. We don't want to hold on to properties that could potentially become blighted or a detriment to the neighborhood or a blight on the neighborhood. It's, it's, it's not good for the surrounding property owners. So we've identified in the first round um, four properties that we're going to be looking at over the next couple of months. Ideally, we'd like to have them auctioned at the same time, but we'd rather do all of the due diligence and get them prepared to bring in the best value that we can, so they may not all be ready to go at the same time. The, the one we need to move on quickly is Six Meadow Street. That was a foreclosed tax title property. It is the only property on here that has a, a residential home on it. Um, that is um, that would be one of the first ones that we do, 
Um, all of these have clear title. We've been working with the Zico's group and as well as um, attorney Culper from Culper and Culper, who is our attorney for tax title properties, just to ensure that everything is ready to go. Uh, the auctioneer does a lot of advertising and promotions. He, you can go on his website. He does a great website for different towns and what properties they're selling. He does a targeted mailing to potential uh, buyers who are interested in purchasing uh, properties, and he also sends to the abutters. The auction, when it is held, would be held in town hall, and um, we would have. All, we are working also with town council Hennigan to make sure that we have all the appropriate paperwork and everything drawn up. So this is more of a heads up to you that we're looking to do this. Uh, we want to advertise it heavily. Again, we want to make sure that we follow all of the um, all of the regulations and mass general law with regard to this. It's been a long process to get us to this point. Um, I do want to mention there are a couple of the properties. 20 Elmwood Street is a very fairly long, thin strip of commercial property um, right at the base of Elmwood near, it basically runs along Southbridge Street in a commercial area. So there's a good example of a property that we think if it was I'm not going to say pre-permitted, but if we had a zoning determination letter from the building commissioner saying you could build this on it or you could do that on it, that would attract more interest from someone than just going to an auction and people saying, well, what could I possibly do with it? Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of due diligence we're trying to do. The other two properties are actually they they abut one another um, but on an L shape, and that's 3 Old Millbury and 423 South Street. Um, we are in the process, and we will know by the end of this month whether each would perk separately, or if only one perks, we would combine them because it's an L-shaped parcel. So we can either get one house lot out of the two parcels, in which case they'd be auctioned together as one house lot, or potentially if the perk test comes back at the end of um, August and they can both perk, then we have the potential to sell them as two house lots. The preliminary work that had to be done on both of those is there were some wetlands. So we had actually Glenn Krofsky, who was here, um, go in and do some wetlands flagging, um, wetlands identification for us. The flagging will actually be done by the end of this month in probably at the same timing as the perk test. So by doing the extra due diligence on these parcels, we have a better ability to market them and to let people know that you are buying a house lot versus you may be buying a house lot. Um, so we're trying to get all the work done. Um, as we do, we will be putting together a property information package that is it's very uh, uh, extensive that the Zico's group puts together, and we work with our treasurer, our assessor, um, our building commissioner to get everything together. And again, this is in concert with um, Bob Hennigan is involved on looking at the process as well as attorney Coppola. So I just wanted to tell you tonight that this is what we're looking to do. Um, as we get closer, maybe in September, we'd be coming back in to um, let you know what the ex actual dates are and what the board may or may not need to do. Just as a heads up, there's a couple different ways to do this. I believe the board still will have to take a vote to sign the deed to transfer the properties, although there is a Mass General Law, Chapter 60, Section 77B, that allows the board to appoint a custodian of property, and under that law, it appears the custodian, which could be your treasurer, could actually do the paperwork um, for that. But we're working with Bob Hennigan. We want to make sure that we're all in agreement on the process. Every town has a different process. Your town has a different charter, but Mass General Law is still there. So um, Attorney Hennigan will be working with Attorney Coppola and Paul Zikos to make sure that we get the appropriate process in place. And at that time, we'll come back to you for any votes that we may need. Okay. Thank you. Any questions, comments? Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we've got no table items tonight, no member items. Uh, are there any public comments? Being none, we have minutes from April 25th, 2016, May 9, 2016, May 23rd, 2016, and June 27, 2016. Um, any corrections, errors, omissions? Being none, I'll accept them as presented. And it's 9.47. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. So moved. Second.
Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you and good night.